Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Alex. Hello, Alex. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, I think now everybody is, is super busy creating their themes, and we already have you on screen in the projector here in Barcelona and in all the chapters. Uh, you're going to be kicking off the speakers lineup. We're so happy to have you here, and the floor is yours. Oh, uh, yeah. I cannot share my video. Oh, really? The host has stopped it. It's mentioned. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you try now? Uh, yeah. Now it works. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> uh, I know I see you. Great. So, Our... just for people who don't know, while you're preparing your presentation, the drawing behind you was done using some EEG devices. So, guys, this is one of the inspirations that you can take for doing your project today. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the um, invitation to give a presentation today. Um, my name is Alex from GTEC. Um, I will present you today uh, in general about uh, brain computer interfaces a little bit, how you can uh, yeah, measure the, the, the brain signals and also the common strategies that you can use um, for developing uh, a brain computer interface. So, uh, as uh, Firat mentioned uh, to me, some of you have more, maybe more experience already. Others are really uh, maybe starting from scratch. So it's uh, giving you an overview, I think, what can be done. Um, so I shortly uh, introduced uh, my company and then we can already start. Um, so yeah. GTEC, for those of you who don't know us, um, it's a company um, that is developing um, the devices that you need to um, do the measurements of uh, all different kinds of uh, signals from the human body. Um, so we can measure the brain signals, EEG or ECOG if it's invasive, but also other signals like muscle activity, um, ECG, EMG, um, also from eye movements, EOG, or other different kind of uh, sensors um, that you can uh, um, connect. And um, on the other side, it's also um, from our side that we provide a uh, um, rapid prototyping environment so you can have uh, access with the implanted one so you see in the picture below uh, all these red uh, dots there those are uh, electrodes that are directly placed on the uh, on the brain so on the uh, right side you can see a picture where the wires are coming directly out um, so you really get a the, the, the neurosurgeon is opening your scalp uh, and they place the electrodes inside um, because of that you are directly uh, on the cortex, you have here a, a higher, um, um, yeah, uh, you can get higher rates of your signal. So you can see the signal is, can get up to 200 hertz or even higher because all the bones and so on are not in between. So that this gives you a high signal to noise ratio and a high spatial and temporal resolution. Um, electrodes can be really extremely small, so you can really detect on specific points uh, um, the signal. But of course, it's limited for studies as it is invasive. So um, yeah, we will not use it um, so regularly. Um, I want to show you a video now. Um, so what is important, of course, for all of these recordings is that you get a clean EEG signal. And the signal uh, that we provide here, for example, from our device, you can see when the subject is clenching with the T's, for example, then you see this, this artifacts in the signal, but it's always stabilizing very fast um, if you have a, a good signal quality here, uh, especially when you do movements like my colleague uh, did here in, in the backyard of our, our company. So you, of course, you see there is a big artifact so, uh, you, from the movement when he's doing the backflip, but um, Immediately afterwards, the signal is stabilizing again, and you need uh, proper uh, equipment to do this recording so that you get uh, the, 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 the right signal um, and also that you can extract afterwards uh, from, this, from this signal. So this, for example, was a, a, a 
the unicorn system from our side. It's the it's a low cost uh, uh, device that we provide with eight channels. So this works proper uh, very very well for for all of the different uh, common PCI applications. Those electrodes are uh, hybrid dry electrodes, so they they don't need to gel regularly. But if the signal is not so good, or, or if you do um, tasks like my colleague did with a backflip, then you can uh, put some gel there so that the signal is getting more stable. Um, beside that, of course, we have also other uh, solutions with a high amount of channels with the high amp, for example, up to 256 channels, um, also with um, medical certification, for example, available, uh, or other wired amplifiers like the GUSB amp, uh, for example, where you can also measure different other kind of signals in parallel. Um, we have wireless solutions also, of course. Uh, this is with um, Wi-Fi transmission. As you can see in the picture, for example, here, the amplifier is only located in the back, so it's very small um, and you can move around uh, no, no, no problem. So when you have applications where people are running or walking around uh, or, I don't know, traveling in the car, for example, then uh, such solutions are, of course, very uh, uh, easy to handle. There are different versions available of that, uh, also to measure other signals again. Um, this is the latest development that we have, for example, where you can also even unplug all of the electrodes from the, the system. So that allows you to uh, connect different electrode types. Uh, we have wet electrodes, we have these hybrid dry electrodes, um, or if you want to connect sensors, this is also possible. So different applications are possible again here with the setting. Um, if we check for the software, so as, as mentioned at the beginning, we have different software solutions. And nowadays we have combined everything together in our software environment called GTEC Suite 2020. Um, this is handling all of the installation of, of your software. You have access with different programming interfaces like C, .NET, MATLAB, Python, um, but there are also extensions available uh, for Simulink or standalone recording softwares. Uh, solutions and also on online you find free available tools for, uh, so like open vibe for example is very common uh, commonly used for pci applications for example or pci 2000 uh, is also a well well known uh, tool where our devices are also integrated um, for those of you who didn't uh, uh, do any measurements so far um, so how you can apply uh, for uh, with a cap, how you mount it. Um, I have a video here of uh, the, 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 the setup. Uh, so as you can see, this is with our wired amplifier, for example, um, with 64 channels. So the, uh, the cap consists already, the, uh, the, the electrodes are already inside. So you see all of these red uh, dots on the cap. Those are the, the, the electrodes for the EEG measurement. Um, important is that we have here active electrodes, so there is a pre-amplification inside, uh, which reduces the impedance. Um, there are also passive electrodes available uh, for some applications, but for uh, most of the, the applications nowadays, active are, uh, electrodes are used because they are so uh, easy to handle. Uh, important is for uh, in this case that we use a reference electrode uh, mounted on the on the earlobe with an ear clip. Um, you put some gel, so those are here the wet electrodes. Um, on the forehead, there is a, a one electrode which is the ground electrode. You cannot see it here, but usually in our case it's um, marked with yellow. And then I start to inject gel in all of the uh, single electrodes. And on the, the right window, you see our software for um, the data recording and the visualization. And here, um, the signal is uh, uh, coming in directly. And as you can see with this uh, active electro uh, electrode uh, technology, it takes only like, uh, after I inject the gel, it takes only like two, three seconds maximum so that we have a clean signal. So you see below those electrodes, there is no gel uh, yet. And as soon as I inject the gel, um, we get a signal. 
of course, for the visualization here, you need to filter the signal. So it's uh, a filtering usually done, I don't know, from 0 0.5 to 30, 30 hertz or more, depends on the application that you, that you uh, run. But you also have always access to the raw signal, of course. So, um, but yeah, for the visualization, the, the, uh, the signal needs to be filtered. I move a little bit forward in this video um, because it takes a, a, a little bit of time. So this is a one shot uh, where we uh, really measured on time how long it takes to mount uh, a cap like that. Um, so yeah, after approximately five minutes, uh, the, the main drop is done. Um, a little bit more, and then you can see that we have uh, good signal uh, everywhere. Um, I stop it shortly. So when uh, you have the setup, um, then always check also that the signal is is really an an, e an EEG signal, so that you uh, that you see a reaction uh, in the signal. For example, when you move your eyes, so when you make eye blinks, or when you um, yeah. Uh, when you are biting, so these big artifacts that you can see in the middle right now here, those are really from when you move your 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 uh, your mouse and when you bite, for example. So please avoid to have I don't know a chewing gum during a measurement inside, so that uh, will uh, uh, generate a lot of uh, movement artifacts. Eye blinks, you cannot really avoid that, of course, because that's a natural thing, but it's usually not so critical. On the other side, there are also methods to remove those afterwards if needed um, but you it's important that you see um, that you see here some uh, activity because sometimes noise when you record noise can also look very similar and uh, this small test is showing you okay I get EEG signals and yeah here in around six minutes we put on the cap and uh, everything was uh, set up so I would say yeah, if you are new, then it takes maybe a little bit longer because you don't know exactly about the amount of gel that you need and so on. It's a little bit, uh, takes a little bit of experience, of course, but uh, usually these active electrodes make the life very, very easy um, compared with the passive ones, uh, for example. Uh, here, uh, a similar short video with the, uh, the uh, mounting of 16 electrodes. Uh, with the dry uh, uh, electrode system. So this is a little bit uh, uh, with the, the, the older version of these electrodes with, uh, where we had the gold pin electrodes, um, but still the principle is the same. So here we put on the cap and uh, also again, the electrodes are uh, directly fixated. In case of uh, dry sensors, we usually use um, the reference and the ground uh, on the mastoid position behind the, the left and right ear. And then what I do with the, the, the electrodes is I twist them shortly left, right, so that I really guarantee that I'm touching the, um, the skin so that we get a uh, good signal. And then in the visualization, again, we can see that the signal is stabilizing. Um, pretty fast. So this is the, the, the important uh, point for, for all these applications that you really get proper signals. Otherwise, yeah, you do a lot of recordings maybe and that doesn't make sense uh, at all if the signal is not fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was mainly the overview of how you can get the, 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 the signals in general. Of course, there are different uh, manufacturers of, of uh, such solutions um, with, yeah, uh, for the different applications. Um, but yeah, this is this is uh, in general how you you can measure the signals. And now for the uh, for the PCI applications, there are different uh, mental strategies usually that you can use um, for the stimulation. So as mentioned at the beginning, you need some kind of stimulation or, or a task for the subject um, so that you can get uh, changes in the, in the signal or that you can observe uh, 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 anything here um, that you can use to control then your device. Um, mainly we have these five strategies that are listed here. Um, the first one is uh, with, uh, based on slow cortical potentials. Um, 
we don't do any applications any, uh, any longer with this um, method because um, yeah, it's pretty hard to, to detect those low cortical potentials. And uh, usually it's also pretty, yeah, you very easily get artifacts in, in, in those. Um, that's why we don't usually use this kind of method. Uh, and we directly uh, start with the second one, which is uh, with uh, event-related uh, changes um, of the activity when you do, for example, an imagination of, of a motor movement. Um, so here the idea is whenever you imagine the movement of your, uh, your hand, um, the uh, synchronization and desynchronization of, your, uh, of the EEG signal happens. And you see that mainly over the motor uh, area. So you see here on this picture uh, in, this, in the uh, corner, in the right lower corner, uh, there is position C3 and C4. So on the cap, you usually have a coordinate system. And those positions are the one where you see the higher, the most activity usually when you imagine a, a left or a right hand movement. Important to know is when you imagine a right hand movement, the left hemisphere of your brain is active. So um, as you can see, right hand movement here, um, the red spot is more on the left side of the brain, vice versa. If you have left hand imagination, it's on the right side of your brain. Um, so what does this uh, synchronization and desynchronization mean of the signal? Here we have position C3, as you saw before on the picture, this is uh, on the left side of the brain. Um, and we have here always from this electrode, um, the signal. So it's like, uh, I don't know, 30 times the signal of this uh, single position. And now the, uh, the subject is asked to perform uh, a, a finger movement. And you probably cannot really see a big difference right now. Um, so therefore I add this uh, part here, um, where you can see actually in this, at this uh, specific point where we have the, uh, the, the indication now, there, the subject was performing uh, a right uh, index finger movement. So um, this, um, this phenomenon of uh, synchronization and desynchronization of the signal happens already when you perform a movement. So when, whenever we do a movement with our hand, or uh, we see this uh, in the, you can see this in the in the brain signals. And as you can see, while the subject was performing the movement, the signal is very small. So the amplitude is very small. And be, uh, before the movement and also after the movement, the amplitude is getting very big. So if you uh, uh, have a look on the different bands of the, uh, of the EEG signal, so the alpha band, beta band and so on, you can uh, observe this, uh, this, this uh, changes here. And with this, you can detect, okay, now the subject is doing a, a, a movement. The signal looks very similar if you imagine the movement. So when you uh, think on the movement, you imagine the movement, then this, this uh, same happens in the brain. And this is what we are using for the PCI uh, system. And nowadays we use it, for example, in our case, in our uh, company for the rehabilitation of stroke patients. So stroke patients very often have the issue that uh, one side is affected, like let's say, okay, the, the, in, in his case, the, the left side would be affected. Um, so he cannot move the, the left arm uh, or maybe the left leg properly. Um, for this purpose, uh, of course, patients can do standard rehabilitation methods, but our idea is to uh, train not the, the arm directly. Our goal is to train the brain. Um, so in the brain, we want to generate so-called brain plasticity. And uh, this is uh, um, generated when we yeah, do here this uh, imagination task. So the idea is the patient can see on the monitor uh, this avatar, left and right side, and we uh, give the command to the patient, okay, now you imagine a left hand movement, for example, and then the, uh, the BCI system is detecting, okay, the patient is imagined now, left-hand side, and then we give the feedback. So the avatar on the, uh, on the screen is moving. And additionally, we use functional electrical stimulation. So you can see on the arm of the patient, there are some electrodes for muscle stimulation. So actually the arm is moving as well, um, triggered with the BCI. So uh, whenever he is imagined, then 
the arm is moving also in parallel with the avatar on the screen. Um, even if the patient cannot move the arm with the functional electrical stimulation, it will be moved uh, anyway. So here we have also a video about that. So this is one, uh, one of our patients in, in, in our facility in, in Austria, where a physiotherapist is working with patients regularly. And as you can see for him, it's simply, you also hear the commands. Uh, uh, in this case, we use uh, headphones, for example, of, okay, now you imagine a left-hand movement or now you imagine a right-hand movement. If the patient is not concentrating, so if the patient is not doing anything, then nothing will happen. So we, we are not stimulating them and we are not giving the visual feedback on the screen um, because this is important that the patient also see, okay, if I'm not doing anything, then not, nothing will happen. So it's really paired with the, with the brain activity. And if the patient is focused, then we get the, the feedback. If the patient is not focused, we don't get the feedback. And uh, here I have a result. Um, we have a lot of results already nowadays because we had measured, uh, yeah, we treated uh, hundreds of patients already. But uh, this is one example that I want to present um, of this uh, lady. Um, she's, um, or she was 38 years old when we did the study uh, a few, few years ago. Uh, and she had a stroke um, 14 months ago. So more, more than one year and her right side was affected. Um, here we can see this test. Um, so you have this, uh, yeah, the sticks. This is already the 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 point uh, the part where she is putting them back. So usually they are inside already. You put them out uh, to the to the other side, and then you uh, need to put them back in those small uh, holes, and you measure the time for that. So this is actually already when uh, in the post assessment. Um, for her, more important, of course, was to use her her uh, uh, her arm again. And uh, before she had the stroke, she was running a, her own. Uh, uh, yeah, she worked as a hairdresser, and uh, now she's even able to uh, work in this job again. So she can uh, really do the the the, the hair cutting again. So this is really a, a good option for her again now to, to, to even work. Um, she did some standard therapy, but this was not working or it was helping her of course, but uh, only still a certain point and with recovery, we could here improve even more. Um, this is also available for the leg um, nowadays. So we implemented also a leg version where we st simply stimulate other muscle parts uh, on the on the leg here and also the avatar looks a little bit different um, yeah i will skip the video because it's uh, pretty similar to the other one um but yeah what would we what should we do if we want to have like more degrees of freedom so we had now like left hand right hand foot imagination for example but yeah what would be an option to do more um, for this purpose, as mentioned uh, at the beginning, we can use invasive recordings, for example. And here we have a study from one of our customers from uh, the US, Kai Miller, a neurosurgeon who is working in this field uh, also to do research. And um, what he did is, for example, a similar task like before, we have a hand movement task. And what he was comparing is, um, with the surface electrodes that we had before, we are measuring the low frequency band. So I said, yeah, up to 40 Hertz, 30, 40 Hertz. You can uh, find here uh, the, the signal uh, with EEG electrodes. And you see this in this green area. Um, with the invasive recordings, you can uh, also get the higher frequencies. And here you have the high frequency band uh, available. So this would not be possible to measure with the um, surface electrodes and here we also have uh, a different picture uh, of the uh, these two tasks important to know is that with the uh, the low frequency band usually as you can see a, a big area of uh, in, in the brain is giving you this uh, this, this activity so um, yeah the, the motor cortex is active so you see a big 
big part of the brain that is active when you do this task. In case of the high frequency band, you can really identify single spots where this act activity is coming from. So single uh, positions where you get this, this activity. And what we can uh, do now with that, so what he did, for example, was to use uh, different sensors on different uh, positions of uh, the fingers. And he compared the activity with the brain activity. So whenever you see the activity on the on the the, the thumb position, for example, when the finger was or the, the thumb uh, was was moving, then also in, he could find uh, the activity in the in the electrodes, and he could really identify the single electrodes where we get the highest activity. Um, we use that nowadays for so-called brain mapping. So whenever you have, for example, like um, yeah. Uh, uh, brain tumor surgery or so, um, then the neurosurgeon wants to know what is exactly at this position, what uh, happens there. And for this purpose, uh, we the, the, the patient gets uh, electrodes implanted and we ask them to do some specific tasks. So uh, you can, for example, depending on where the location is, when you know it's over the motor area, for example, then you do more like motoric tasks, but you can also use other tasks like listening to a story. Um, this is, for example, here sticking out the tongue so that we know um, when he's moving the tongue where the locations are. And with this software, we, we can uh, identify the, the single locations um, where the electrodes are, are active. Um, and, and show the activity. So with this, you get a map and know exactly, okay, when I remove this area, then maybe the patient afterwards is losing a functionality. So now we have the listening to the, to the story um, and, and so on. So it can have different uh, uh, settings here and you repeat the tasks a couple of times, but it's a uh, 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 very, convenient and fast method for the patient to get uh, this, this overview. Usually you would use electrical stimulation of the brain and this can really be yeah, uh, painful. You can generate uh, epileptic seizures, for example, and so on. So this is not really uh, good to do, but with this uh, Cortex-Q mapping software, it's, uh, yeah, you cannot generate any, any problems uh, and have a, a map pretty fast. Um, it, it, with one of the patients, we also did a, a study here um, with a PCI system, for example, where um, we do we used face decoding. So as you can see, the patient is looking to the to the pictures of uh, the doctor here, some with faces and others with uh, Japanese signs. And on the screen, you can see the online detection. So whenever the a face is shown then the BCI detects the face. So we exactly know uh, the positions now for face decoding and also for sign decoding. Um, yeah, it's funny when he watches to the face of the doctor, he's not directly detected because he's seeing the face of the doctor so, so often um, so that there was no, no reaction directly. Um, so this is some ongoing research with, with our uh, uh, cooperation partners from several countries uh, where we do this um, invasive recordings as well. But yeah, as I said, it's invasive. So is there maybe an option to uh, get similar signal quality, uh, but not with an, in, an, a neurosurgery necessary? Um, we are working now on a solution called uh, the pangolin grid. Um, pangolin is this uh, animal that you can see here. And the electrode that we are using uh, has a pretty similar um, shape. So here it's a very small electrode where we have 16 positions actually uh, on this small uh, um, part. The black clip is to connect the, this, this uh, small grid and then you can directly get uh, uh, the, the, the signal here. This is for example, uh, a montage with uh, 1000 channels and you can and you are able now to control for example this uh, this um, dress developed by Anouk Wiebrecht uh, uh, yeah, a fashion designer for tech design and you can control the light of the of the, the dress for example all of these parts can be moved uh, and this can be controlled with a PCI system 
Okay. Um, yeah, I want to move directly forward with the next option, which is the so-called evoked potentials, where you use um, different kind of stimulation, visual, tactile, electrical stimulation, auditory stimulation, and you generate this, uh, a so-called P300 uh, in the signal. So whenever you are looking on an icon on the screen, which is flashing up, then we have uh, a visual evoked potential. If we now make the task more complicated, so if we have a, a, like a matrix flashing up with icons, then we get this so-called P300. So after around 300 milliseconds, we can see here, um, we have a peak when we average a couple of times. So for example, when we are now focusing on the character in the circle, and I start with the flashing, whenever we are focusing on this one icon, then we get the, um, the P300. So you always get the, 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 the visual evoke potential because when it's flashing up, but you get this P3 only when it's cognitive relevant for you. So when you uh, want to select it. So like that, when it's flashing up. And here is a comparison between the icon that you were paying attention and all the other icons. So the green curve is the one that we were looking, for example, uh, letter W. And here we have the peak in the in the in the signal, and the orange curve is the uh, the other non-target. So all of the uh, the the positions, uh, all of the other characters where we are not paying attention. You can speed that up now with a row column flash, for example, so that uh, only rows and columns are flashing up. So different options to improve. Uh, here we had, for example, an option with a face speller where we used for highlighting uh, faces of famous people, um, actors and so on, musicians. Um, and this imp was improving our accuracy uh, directly for yeah, around 10, 15% for all of the subjects. So actually, with this one, I had no uh, nobody yet, uh, no, no healthy subject uh, who was not able to use it properly. So um, usually this is uh, working with, with all people very, very good. Um, the problem is now with, yeah, with people who can use uh, their eyes or who can focus, uh, it, you can use uh, such methods, but what would happen if we cannot uh, use it because patients are in a coma or in a minimal consciousness state or in a so-called locked in state. So you have uh, maybe cognitive functions, but your motor functions are pretty low or you even don't have really high cognitive functions because of an accident or so. So then this uh, would not work with the visual stimulation. Um, we have a system called Mind Beagle, where we use, for example, tactile stimulation. So with uh, vibration on the arm or on the finger. And with that, you can also generate a so-called, um, this, this P300. Um, it looks a little bit different to the one that we saw before with the visual one, because you don't have this visual stimulation, of course, but you have this, this, this tactile stimulation. And also here we can see a, a difference in the, in the activity. And this would, for example, allow if you have um, some, some of this uh, to answer yes and no questions or even to have further communication. So in, this, in the tool, for example, it looks like that when you have uh, um, left and right hand side, you explain the patient, okay, now you concentrate on your right side and this would mean yes. And then you concentrate on the left side and this would mean no, for example. So then the, the, the loop is, is showing that to you. Um, and in this video, we, we ask, for example, the patient to, uh, I think I didn't share the sound. I didn't share the sound with you, but uh, so the patient is, is asked in Italian if, uh, um, if my colleague is speaking in Italian, then um, the answer should be, be yes. So, um, so she's concentrating, of course, for this task, the patient is, uh, needs to understand that you, um, yeah, uh, uh, that she can answer with yes, if she's co concentrating on the right-hand side, for example, uh, and answer no, if she's concentrating on the other side. So this is important, uh, of course, that the patient can uh, understand the, the tasks here. So 
and yeah, after some uh, some seconds, the PCI system is detecting the the site with the answer, and in this case, it was correct. Um, usually, when we, we work with these uh, locked in patients, for example, of course, we ask the questions a couple of times so that we uh, are aware um, if it's really correct. Important is here that a lot of those patients that are maybe classified as a yeah uh, a coma patient or like a, a minimal consciousness patient, they are sometimes have higher cognitive functions even so um, yeah that's important for the family so often that they know okay there is still some activity for um, in the brain um, so that they can hear for example when when you, when you are close to them or so when you're talking with them so that's important um, and yeah let's switch to the uh, force option called um, steady state evoked potentials. So we had here this picture before when an icon is flashing up, uh, then we have a visual evoked potential. If we now change that, so we have a, a constant frequency, let's say seven hertz in this case, um, and we check again the signal, we can find the seven hertz component in the brain uh, activity. So you can see at seven hertz there is a peak and also on the harmonics like 14 hertz uh, 21 so there we can see okay we've, we can find the stimulation um, if we make it now more complicated okay we have like with two stimulation uh, points with one with a higher frequency the other one with a lower frequency we already have an, op an opportunity to make a selection so this is already a, uh, a basic PCI application with two two uh, options for the selection and of course now you can make your different settings with uh, more degrees of freedom so what we did once with a group from the university in Graz was to interface uh, an online game probably most of you know World of Warcraft um, where we control the uh, the game using the PCI um, you can see here on the screen, um, there is the, the game environment and below uh, and around this environment, you have this black area. And in the black area, we have uh, cursors to move left, right, move forward. And there is this action button, we call it like um, yeah, this, this hand on the top. This is simply automatically doing tasks for you in the yeah depending on the on the on the scenario so if there is an item on the floor for example then you can pick it up or if there is an enemy close to you you can attack the enemy and um, I have here again a video um, with some information here and where you can see how that works I'm, I'm moving a little bit forward because at the beginning there is some in introduction um, as well But yeah, here I stop here shortly. So here you can see whenever we do the, the, the this 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 PCI application, for example, you need to do a calibration first, so where we see how the brain activity looks like uh, when you are doing this task. So my colleague here is looking actually on the uh, on the icon that is indicated in the in the in the green uh, rectangular. So right now it's uh, at the moving forward. Um, position. So he is focusing there, and all of those four have different frequencies. Um, so, like as we saw before, with the different uh, numbers, and he is now concentrating on this one, and we are measuring the brain activity. So I move a little bit forward. All of those items are trained, so we go one by one, uh, repeated a couple of times. So now it's, for example, right hand side, um, and we are measuring the activity. And then we are offline processing, generating a classifier. So his task is only focusing on the, on, on the specific one that is marked. The other ones you should not pay attention in general. And then when you have the classifier, you can actually start the game and control the game. Um, so whenever he's looking on the specific uh, item, it always takes, of course, a little bit of time because we need to find the component in the in the brain signal uh, of this frequency, but then it allows you to control the game. So you can move the the avatar, and yeah, 
if he's not using his hand, so a patient even would also be uh, able to use that, and nobody would notice it actually that you are a patient if because it's online. So when you play with others, um, of course, with the keyboard, you as I said, there is a little bit of delay. You would be faster always with the keyboard still. But if there are several patients playing against each other, for example, then uh, or together, then they have uh, the, 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 the same um, starting point. So um, yeah, then for all the conditions would be the same. But this is also still an opportunity for uh, like a patient to, to, to um, play co uh, computer games, for example. And the last option I would uh, want to mention is uh, so-called uh, with code-based evoked potentials. So here um, it's indicated here a little bit on the on the left side. You see, on the uh, with the previous method we had always uh, constant uh, um, flickering. So seven hertz, for example, ten hertz, always with the same uh, with the same uh, um, speed. In the code-based uh, version, we use uh, here sometimes faster and sometimes it's uh, slower flickering. So it's really like, okay, it's uh, flickering fast and then it's going slower, faster again, slower and so on. And with this, you generate uh, a code and for each icon, you can uh, then have variation of this code. And uh, this, can again be found in the in the brain activity when you when you do a, uh, an analysis, and one of the the tasks that we did in a study, for example, here was we uh, my colleague uh, placed here uh, like a track um, with a, a, a small robot. So the red circle is the robot that was, is uh, able to move around. So you can move it forward, backward, turn it left, and turn it right. And the task was to follow simply this this track. Um, with the control through a BCI. So we, he used video cameras so that we saw the robot on the screen. And on the screen, he placed an, uh, for example, on, the, on screen stimulation, but also uh, LEDs on the outside of the screen. So different settings here. And then he, we, we, we did the, the, the task using the, this uh, SSVP from before with the constant frequencies. Um, and then he used the code based. Um, uh, um, stimulation, and what we could clearly see is with the with this uh, eleven subjects that the code based uh, the guy in the back is only there for protecting the robot that it's not falling down because this uh, device is pretty expensive as you can imagine, so they don't want to destroy it. And now the the with the BCI system he can control the robot to move uh, around. And you don't even need to be in the same room or, or, or so you, nowadays it's possible also to, to use uh, yeah, network connections and then send the commands um, via network and you can sit in a different building or even yeah, far away and control uh, devices for it. Um, and now, yeah, what you can do is for example to to put the the bottle on the on the the table. So as you can see, of course, it's still these robots are, are also not so fast yet. But um, this video is also a little bit uh, yeah, like a few years old. I think in the in the next years, those things are also getting better, of course. And now he can switch again the mode and drop the item. So on the screen, it's flashing up again with the different positions, and then he can select where he wants to place the item, for example. OK. Yeah, with this, I want to, want to close my talk in principle. Um, so, so I hope you get. I hope you got an overview of all the different options that we, we, we have or that there are available to do a PCI application. Um, maybe yeah, if you want to have more information, you can follow us on LinkedIn or me or yeah, visit our website. Um, we also organize from time to time hackathons. So if you maybe uh, yeah, join now the first time with the Neurotech X team uh, and you say that's something that I want to continue on, um, yeah. We also do sometimes hackathons. Um, so 
would be great if we can uh, if we can see you there as well um, in the future. So yeah, then you can also try out our devices directly um, if you join one of our our uh, hosting partners. And yeah, with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope you got a, an overview and now. Uh, there are still three minutes left, I think, for questions, yeah. but I can I can stay a little bit longer if needed for answering yeah, questions. Yeah, no, in we the, have some questions Q&A. from the audience, uh, so maybe we can do that uh, in the meanwhile. I mean, today is quite relaxed because we're going to be here for all day, so no problem with the uh, minutes. So the first sure. question is from Mario. It says, with motor imagery, we can predict if the user or patient are thinking of closing or opening their right hand, for example. Is it possible to calculate the force applied? So if the user patient are closing the right hand firmly or maybe just holding something fragile. Um, I think he's, he's asking more about the intensity of the signal and if that affects the motor or the kinetic kind of movement. Mm. We didn't try that so far, but I think it's not really an, an option. Of course, what you can see is uh, you can see when somebody is more f- focusing, uh, or when the when the the, the 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 yeah, it's more intense that we see. Okay, now it's like right hand side, for example, or now it's more left hand side. We can see that, um, but it's uh, yeah to really have a different. Uh, forces for example i think that's that's pretty hard but if you have a device for example where you see okay when i concentrate more then it's getting more um that for sure uh, in our case with the with the electrical stimulation for example you can see when it's when the detection is only a little bit then we stimulate all, also only a little bit so this is like uh, also already a little bit uh, and 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 uh, a direction so then we stimulate only a little bit and the arm is moving only slowly and, and, and it's not so far. If we get really a clear picture, okay, now it's like right hand side, then we get full stimulation and the arm is really f- doing the full movement. So this can be applied, but like we, with a force, yeah, hard probably, but I think could also be interesting, yeah, to, to see. Yeah, I think it's, it's cool. I mean, the study between the motor activity and the signals, I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good kind of interesting place to, to look. The other one is, does the classifier needs update every day? The patient wants to play the game in SSBEP. If so, how does it how does it take? And I think it will make sense as well to explain more how does it work between different people. So because this is something you know more about. Um, yeah. So um, usually, of course, it's always the best if you can uh, update the classifier every day because yeah, maybe. You have to consider the put the cap is maybe not on the uh, the same position exact same position. Maybe the patient feels not uh, so good because I don't know he's maybe tired or so. So uh, it's always good to have a, a fresh classifier, of course. But it's also possible in general to use uh, a, a classifier that you generated a few days ago. So most of these methods, also like the P three hundred speller, for example, the the classification is pretty stable over time so it looks very similar and also like in the in the in the uh, in some of these uh, um, methods we, what we, we already used a kind of a general classifier or generic classifier that we generated from different subjects so we measured a lot of people and then we merged all the data to prepare a kind of a general classifier um, for all of them this also works for a lot of people but uh, the best is always to have the 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 the, the yeah, your own classifier and the fresh one, especially when we are talking, for example, again about this rehabilitation method with the stroke rehabilitation, because there the activity in the brain is changing with the brain plasticity, and then you need a, anyway always an, a fresh classifier because maybe in session one you have a different picture of your brain than in session twenty, for example. Um, so I would recommend to 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 use a, a fresh classifier if possible, but yeah you can use also a a previous one. I cannot hear you now. But I see the the last question, for example, was about the... I think your microphone is muted or so. I don't know. Yeah, I can. There's. Uh, oh, sorry. Now I, yeah. now, now I can hear you again. 
Great, great, great. So it's from Elias and Kelly's device in how to detect interim organ paralysis. Mm, yeah, so we, we never we never used it for, for, for such a purpose and I'm not sure if it really can detect that uh, in general. So um, yeah, that's some... What do you think about like prediction, like prediction uh, phenomena? I think a lot of a lot of the machine learning stuff is based on prediction models that actually work in this way. But the classes point that on, on prediction machine learning. Do you think it's a prediction or some of that? Uh, yeah, I think there are groups working on this uh, already nowadays. Uh, this might work, yeah. Um, but to be honest, I have no experience with that uh, from our side. So. Yeah. So we have one more question with someone actually from the from the hackathon working on something. They just keep, they just ask if they can use uh, DTEC licenses for the hackathon. I was like, that's a tough one. I'll ask Alex. <laughs> Uh, it would be possible, and but yeah, today unfortunately there yeah, is no nobody in the office, and I cannot give yeah, no licenses around. Before, but I just had to uh, ask because uh, I'm just asking what people are asking, right? Um, sure. We have the last one from DC. Is the code based evoked potential with VR? Was there any experiment made with regards? Brain activity for different experiments in VR, such as drone, shelter mercy video, or roller coaster rides, etc. Do such activities and immersive spaces have any impact on brain signals because the body is static? But we perceive those high to Um, some of my colleagues are working in this a uh, little bit as well uh, with some with some uh, yeah uh, kind of different settings here in the VR. Um, I tried it once, like where, with a with a yeah, like a roller coaster ride, uh, which actually I was a little bit yeah uh, have, had a, a bad feeling afterwards in the stomach when I was using it um, because I yeah, never used it before. Um, but we have no 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 publication from our side about that yet, so I don't know if uh, yeah if there is really a, a, any change to see in the in the brain signal. Um, but I can imagine that there are groups uh, working on that uh, as well. So yeah, I guess it will be it will be actually more fun to try to like uh, kind of stimulate some parts of the brain using invasive uh, technologies as a feedback from the VR. That's going to be super cool. <laughs> that would also be interesting, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, like, this was all the questions that we had. I mean, uh, that was great. Alex, I mean, as an introduction, I think everybody had, like, a super nice overview. I want to say that uh, one of my first hackathon, hackathons was the Brain IO as well. Um, uh, at GDEC, and I think there's there's much more for everybody to, to look at. In some of the locations, we are sharing some hardware, so we're sharing some uh, GTEC, so like Open BCIs, Muses, and some other DIY kits. So people are going to be playing with them, and then we're going to see what will happen in the end. Uh, yeah. If somebody is is very inspired as well, I should maybe shout out for the BCI awards that you guys uh, are part of. So yeah, I, I, have like, no, I had no slide in, inside because no uh, problem. Uh, I got you here. <laughs> so if somebody has like a fascinating project, uh, check out the BCI awards. You can you can apply it there as well. So if you win this one, you might want to apply to the other uh, one and win a prize for your project. Um, thanks again, Alex, for being here. And yeah, now I think it's time to move to our next speaker. Yeah, thanks for having me and yeah, uh, have fun at the hackathon. It's always interesting to see what people can develop in such a short time. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Hello, Ivan. Yes, hello. You can hear me, right? Yes, yes. Perfect. I can hear you. Awesome, I can see you. So we're starting maybe five minutes before time, which is great. Um, hey, if you ask, I think I was supposed to be on. Oh, Christina, where are you? I, I thought... yeah, I'm here. I wrote you a chat. <laughs> I just can't see you. Um, 
the host has stopped my video, so I think you need to uh, initialize it. That's great. Um, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to try to log off and log in again? Sure, I'll do this really quick. Okay, I um, you have to do something because it says that the host has stopped my video. No, you, you should. The thing is, you're 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 in with. So your name is my name. That's why I I couldn't, I couldn't see your name. Oh, strange is that? Okay, well. So I just want to apologize from everyone just to make clear what happened. So, so Christina is is very tight on time. She has a fifteen minute talk uh, from twelve to twelve fifteen, uh, but then uh, we messed up. I didn't see her name, so we moved on to Ivan. I apologize, Ivan. So Christina is going to make her quick talk, and then we jump to Ivan. So yeah, sorry for sorry, sorry Ivan for, for for booting you out, and also hi Ivan. Yeah, yeah, it was very yeah, strange. Hi, hi. <laughs> no, no worries. I'm looking forward to your talk. Ivan okay, and I so have known each other for uh, like Christina, or something. So the floor okay, is yours. Yeah. Sorry, I'm actually not Firas. I am I am Christina. Um, <laughs> Uh, so first of all, a huge thank you to Pierre for inviting me here today. I'm super happy to join and thanks to Neurotech X for hosting this event. I absolutely love what Neurotech X and all of its chapters do. So I'm very honored to be here. And this is actually not the first NTX event I've been involved in. In February of this year, I was also giving a talk about the crossover between industry and science in neurotechnology at the Biosense XR Symposium, also which uh, Homan was hosting. Um, so maybe some of you recognize me from there, but if not, a bit about myself. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and experimental psychologist by training. After my PhD at the University of Oldenburg in Germany and postdoc at the Center for Brain and Mind Science at the University of Trento in Italy, I worked clinically for a few years at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada, before I started working in industry, and that's with Brain Products. And Brain Products has involved, been involved with NTX and Neurotech X services at various levels throughout the years. For example, most recently, we're sponsoring the BCI Student Club competition, so I hope to see some of you there as well. And we hope to continue to have many close collaborations in the future. So what are we actually doing? Okay, Brain Products is like a pretty self-explanatory name, um, but we're manufacturers for hardware and software solutions for neurophysiology researchers. That means EEG, electroencephalography devices, and many associated accessories and other biosensors. We offer amplifiers that are stationary and lab-based, which we often see used by researchers who are employing classic experimental protocols, as well as amplifiers designed specifically for EEG fMRI recordings. We also have mobile wireless amplifiers, perfect for naturalistic settings or the field of mobile brain body imaging. To go with our amplifiers, we offer electrotypes for every recording scenario, some of which you can see on my slide right now. Our active gel-based electrodes remain the gold standard and have the highest signal quality with a relatively easy preparation. And we also have classic AG, AGCL passive electrodes, which are rather good. Christina, I, I don't know if you want to do that, but you're not sharing any slides. At least I'm not seeing them. Ah, you're not seeing them. Okay. Um, let me, thanks for letting me know. Um, share. Okay, here we go. Your screen. Thanks, Yvonne. You're a lifesaver. Okay, great. So good thing I said refer to the slide. I assume everybody can see it now. And can you still hear me? Okay, so everything is fine. Oh, technology. <laughs> um, okay, great. So as I said, you could see some of our electrodes here on the screen. Um, and we also have dry electrodes as well as saltwater sponge-based electrodes for minimal preparation time and still a relatively good signal quality. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sponge-based electrodes later on. Mm, so now I want to talk a little bit about the industry and science aspect of what we do. Um, I want to show you how we're addressing the academic research community and how this helps us to address other market segments like industry research and neurotechnology enthusiasts. So first I want to start off with a bit of background about the people at Brain Products because I think our past history really helps to shape our current perspectives. Most of us have PhDs and some kind of postdoc or research experience and 
Many of us have been scientists too, so it's really easy for us to get into the shoes of our end users as we have all been in that place before, you know, in the lab, doing research, collecting precious data and relying heavily on equipment to deliver reliable data without any hassle. But now we're all in industry and we are not a company that does research per se. Sure, we do our in-house testing, research and development, but we're not conducting any research studies by ourselves. If we do anything uh, research project oriented, this is in collaboration with other scientists and labs at, at labs and universities, as well as industrial partners. For example, in some EU funded projects that we're involved in. So for us, it's about knowing scientifically what we can do to inform product development ideas, adding new features and generally improving on future iterations in a data-driven approach that's facilitated by our, by our contacts within the scientific community. Um, so therefore, to get this uh, contact with the scientific community, we interact with our customers and end users a lot. Before Corona, this was mostly at conferences, having conversations at the booth about research activities, as well as posters and talk, as well as visiting posters and talk research project or experiment you'd like to share with us. We are welcoming applications for guest blog posts from the community. So please don't be shy and definitely drop us a line to see how your work can be featured. So if this product speaks to you in any way that you think it could address your needs in, or your neurotech pursuits, or maybe you're just interested in learning more and want to keep in the loop about any developments, then please go to the link on the screen. I'll also pop that in the chat. And if anybody will be at the SFN in November in San Diego, definitely stop by our booth and give the X on a try. You'll have it there and our scientific consultants will be more than happy to give you a demo, show you the live data stream and answer any remaining questions that you may have. So with that final note, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and look forward to seeing the results of this hackathon. If you'd like to get in touch with me personally to discuss any of the topics mentioned today in my talk, please feel to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And just one more thing to close off, I really want to thank the Neurotech X community and Pierre for inviting me today. I am really looking forward to seeing all of the innovation that will come out of this weekend's event. So thank you so much. I can't hear you. I still can't. Well, yes. so much. Enjoy. Thanks, Christina. Bye. So, um, so on today's agenda, I'm going to prepare, a, basically make a personal introduction, then I'm going to explain you about neurotechnologies, PCIs, and, neo, and then we are going to make an important study on the neuromodulation part, which is the part that enables us to understand how to actually uh, induce uh, um, action potentials in neurons by applying electrical activity. And then it, we are going to have a quick look to the ecosystem uh, of the industry and finally to neuroethics. So let's start um, about a personal introduction. My name is Guillaume Monceau, as I mentioned, and I have uh, a master's in neuroengineering. Uh, but of course, I come from a background in electronics engineering and also um, robotics engineering. This is my phase after <laughs> having a cathartic experience walking for one entire day through the, the, the Peruvian jungle uh, while it was raining the whole day. So yeah, I thought it was a fun picture. As a highlight project, uh, I started by, having, by working at the par ALBA particle accelerator, doing some studies on energy efficiency and so on. Uh, which allowed me later on to move to work at the ITER fusion nuclear reactor. There I was doing some um, technical activities, supervising them and managing some of the stuff. And finally, uh, because of my experience in during my, my high school with some uh, bionic uh, implants, I also had that, you know, a little 
are interesting uh, passion for this uh, this big passion for the bionics you know so that's why i did my masters in neuroengineering neural engineering which allowed me to do to work at in brain neuroelectronics doing the design and simulation of uh, and analysis of uh, of a vagus nerve neurostimulator so yeah, talking about neurotechnologies, we understand that neurotech encompasses any method or device where electronics intersect with the nervous system to measure and modulate neural activity. This would be basically a dictionary um, description. However, uh, I think it's a very important field and, and someone which gave us a very important, to, that pointed this out was uh, Steve Jobs, which in his biography, well, published by Walter Isaacson in the page 671, it, it, he mentioned this. I believe that the biggest innovation of the 21st century will be born from the intersection between biology and technology. This is the beginning of a new era as it, is, as it has already happened with the digital one when I was younger. And this, I feel it, this speech makes a lot of sense basically because if we now try to innovate in the computational industry, you know, if we try to create a new Apple, it would be practically impossible since since there are already very big players uh, playing in this industry. Therefore, if one wanted to actually create such a big corporation, uh, it's been more important. It's more interesting to actually try to explore new uncharted areas such as is so, such as it is neurotechnology. Um, since, since yeah, the competition is much lower and, and less uh, challenging as, as could be, for example, at it. So let's explore this field, which here we can see how it is distributed, neurotechnology. And there are these main important fields, let's say. In this presentation, we're going to focus on brain computer interfaces and then microsystems, which is the one that is more related for neuromodulation and so on. Uh, regarding implantable neurotechnologies, uh, the, the brain computer interfaces part, we see that this would be like the big world of this uh, field. Um, basically, we can see that it's segmented in different areas, such as electromagnetic, brain sensing, metabolic, and brain stimulating. For brain stimulating, we see that the brain stimulation, electro implanted electrodes, and, and so on. Um, we are going to have a look to this part, not mostly, but of course, then there is the, the one that you many of the previous uh, presenters have already mentioned, such as EEG and ECOG. Here you have the reference in case you want to have a look to this uh, slide, which I think is great to get a better understanding, an overview of the field. Okay, so why? Why is it important to actually Im implant uh, electrodes into the brain, considering the risk it has? So a very good uh, example, the, it is this illustration, which if we ever wanted to actually measure activity, uh, to know what is going on in a, in a, in a stadium, okay? Um, it is, if we, ever, if we were me uh, measuring uh, with a recording outside, from the stadium, it would be very hard to know what is going on at a, a specific area from the stadium. So uh, in order to know what is going on at a specific area, it's important to actually go there. So go in between the people and actually place the, the, the recorder over there. So if we make an analogy between the brain and the stadium, then the people would be the neurons. So it doesn't make sense or it's much harder to know what's going on at a specific area by placing an electrode outside of the brain when, because then we have all the scalp and all the different tissues which uh, distort and, and yeah, gives us less uh, resolution to know what's going on at certain areas. So that's why the brain-computer interface area was divided into two, these two main fields, let's say, the, non the invasive and non-invasive, or can be divided in it. On the right, on the non-invasive part, we can see the ones, uh, the fields we have already seen in the previous presentations. But then on the left, we can see the, the main parts which are related to invasive part, um, such as ECOG, multiple recording sites, and so on. On the right here, you can see a, a, a very simple abstraction of it. On the top, you can see the EEGs, which are on top of the skin. But then if we ever go inside the precortex, then we, we see the, uh, the cortical electrodes and, and local field potential and uh, single units. 
if we ever if we made a representation of a, a graphic here we could see the different technologies for the print recording um, it is divided on the i axis on temporal resolution and the x axis the spatial resolution and there is an, even a, another third dimension which is this one which basically represents the invasiveness of the of the technology being the violet the most invasive and the, the yellowish the, the least one so for temporal resolution we would understand basically um, how fast uh, how many samples per second can a device take um, for example in the pet device for example or the fna ir and so on um, fMRI, for example, they are very least invasive, okay, but they have a very high uh, temporal resolution. And why that's not good? Well, uh, it is important to consider that if a neuron fires, let's say I'm inventing it 100 times per second, um, if the temporal resolution is of one second, uh, we will only see that there has been one single activity. However, that's not real because the neuron has already fired 100 times. So that's why it's important to have a, to have a very uh, low uh, temporal resolution in the sense that we can actually gather all the information that has been displayed at that neuron uh, at that time. And then we have the spatial resolution, which is like how much area or, or volume uh, of information can we gather at the, at the same time, you know? So in the case, of course, here it places the electrode throughout the jugular vein, and then it places it within the brain. This is a very interesting advantage because we do not open the skull, and therefore it's much more uh, friendly that could be the one from Neuralink or, or, or the uterine. Ray. Um, however, uh, there are new developments being uh, put into play, into practice and, and being developed, which this is the one from N3, uh, the N3 pro program from DARPA. And this is a, a proposal made by Patel, which basically they propose this injectable, um, as you can see on the left, these injectable nanoparticles, which go into the current, the current, uh, the, 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 yeah, the blood current, let's say. And, and then these particles are, can go through the blood plane barrier and then get into the brain. And once they are in there, uh, 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 a helmet can be put on top of the skull, on the, on the, of the skull, which basically can read the, this uh, activity of uh, sent by these nanoparticles and can also induce uh, neural activity to activate the neurons. Uh, this would be the more the more the most interesting uh, technology since it's kind of a hybrid. It's invasive, but the type of invasiveness it's just simply by injecting uh, uh, the nanoparticles in the in the bloodstream, which at the same time probably this I think to remember they mentioned that they would be biodegradable, and this would be interesting as well. Um, and then we would have this kind of secondary device on top, which could actually it would look like an EEG device, but in reality would be measuring the activity of these uh, nanoparticles and not from the, directly from the neurons. So in order to understand how it works, the, the, these uh, devices, we can put an example of the electro, uh, electroencephalography acquisition which uh, is a standard one. And we see that basically we gather the information, which in this case could be like a third information, let's say. Uh, and then we basically remove the artifacts from the signals and then we sample the signals and finally we filter them. On the right, you could see like a cleared, uh, uh, a cleared um, signals from in this case the AEG, but then we have also the ECOG and so on. And, and once we have uh, cleared them, then we can extract their features. And what does that mean? Uh, very easy. Um, if, if we suppose that these, uh, these signals were persons, let's say, and the feature extraction, extraction we would basically measure, I don't know, for example, the color of the eyes, the height, the weight, uh, and so on. But uh, in the case of signals, we would basically uh, measure different characteristics such as the frequency of the signal, the amplitude of the signal, and so on. And, and then all this data is basically sampled here. 
and and finally we we, we make it go through a machine learning algorithm which it's very interesting since this machine learning can basically enable us to make a correlation direct correlation between these signals that we gathered and the activity that the person was doing at that specific time of course we would measure the different the activity of that person on for example whether that person is pressing a button for example and then we would create a correlation between the signal that was going on at that specific period that that person pressed the button, as an example. Okay, so now we have explained how the what are the different uh, recording methods and how it's actually the signal, how the signals are processed. And now we move on to the different applications. As a first case, we can see like the motor and somatosensory cortex, which we can uh, it enables to see how, for example. Uh, the, the different parts of the brain. As we can see, the brain can be segmented into, each, each area of the brain is specialized to for certain uh, neural processing, let's say. Uh, and when we can, we can see the primary motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. These are the two main, main areas that we're gonna focus on to, to make, to expose this case. In the case of the somatosensory area, we can see that it can be divided even in even more areas, which is, for example, each area represents a specific part of the body. And, and if we created an, uh, a correlation, like a, we created a, mon, a, a model of, this, uh, uh, of each of these areas, we would obtain this, uh, this uh, let's say, let's figure, which represents a human. And it is, it's part of the, this human, it's proportional to how sensible that part of the body is. So we can see, for example, that the hand is very sensible. We have a lot of uh, neurons dedicated to actually uh, decode the, the information coming, coming from the hands. And that's important because it gives us, we have a very high capacity of actually measuring, uh, the, 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 uh, of actually manipulating tools and, and so on. And then we can also, we have very sensible on the teeth and the tongue and also the ears, as we can see and of course as well the genitals and why that is important well i'm going to explain you because thanks to this kind of one-to-one -one correlation we can place electrodes to for example the motor area and then by placing electrodes to that area we can basically allow for example uh people to 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 control let's say in this case we can see on the right uh, a tetraplegic person actually feeding herself or uh, drinking with a, with a third robotic arm. And of course, as well, measure uh, moving the uh, wheelchair or, or yeah, controlling bionic uh, the peripherics. And then we come to the sensory feedback, which means that by actually inducing activity in the somatosensory part of the brain, we can make things such as the one on the left, uh, where we can see a monkey that is actually controlling through a lever. Uh, it is control a joystick. It's controlling a, a virtual hand. Uh, and this, with this hand, this, this uh, monkey is actually touching two area, two surfaces with different rugosity. And then this sends us a feedback into the brain, which then the monkey is capable of actually detecting, perceiving the difference in rough, in roughness, you know between the two virtual surfaces. And well, we can imagine how that can, how that could apply, be applied to virtual reality now. Well, well. Um, and then on the right, we can see basically a bionic arm, which uh, it's a, a person that has been blinded. And to control this bionic arm, a person needs to have feedback. Usually, as it was the case, this previous case, the feedback is it's mainly visual but that's sometimes a bit imprecise. So what they did is they placed sensors on the hand that acted as the skin, for example, and then they connected these, uh, these touch sensors onto the aff uh, afferent uh, nerves from the, from, the, from, from the limb, let's say. And, and well, basically they could, uh, the person could know when he was blind, uh, when uh, that person was actually grabbing the, an object by just feed, uh, feeling this uh, sensory feedback. Here we can see an example of another application that could be applied on uh, exoskeletons. And well, basically we see a, a person that is uh, it's getting implanted uh, uh, an electrode inside of the skin 
and th this gives us the capacity to actually know like, with more precision what what uh, muscles was that person intending to move. Of course, these uh, these electrodes are designed to be as as much as as much biocompatible as it's possible, although if there are always uh, certain limitations on that sense. And by doing that, we can basically send this neural activity straight to a, an exoskeleton, which uh, can create a, yeah, a direct and one-to-one -one, uh, real-time movement, let's say. And well, we can imagine the different applications it has, either for tetraplegics, paraplegics, or uh, yeah, military applications for sure. And well, this is the first part. Of course, we see, we all know this part where the Neuralink managed to actually uh, make a monkey play to Pong. And well, this is something pretty, pretty remarkable, as we can imagine. And then we also see this person, which is basically uh, playing Final Fantasy with with uh, with electrodes, invasive electrodes on their brain. Okay, so this was the first part on brain-computer interfaces, and now we are going to move to the neuromodulation. This is a very important one because we are going to understand how we can actually induce neural activity with, uh, with uh, electrical activity, let's say. How can we depolarize neurons by uh, inducing current? So if we consider the neuron, uh, we could actually create a, a, understand the neuron as actually a, a battery. And, and how is that possible? Why we can actually create this correlation between a battery and neurons? Well, it's very simple because a battery, what it does is actually accumulate a charge potential, like a current or electrical potential. Uh, we, there are different types of uh, to stay as low as possible. And therefore we can never uh, get these ne the neurons to depolarize. And that's very interesting because if we apply this type of stimulation to your arm, you might be willing, you might be willing to actually move the arm, but the arm would not move at all. And, and this is uh, used a lot in electroceuticals field, which is an another an emerging field in pharma in pharmacology. Well, it's not pharmacology, but uh, uh, electrocology, let's say, which is uh, making uh, treatments uh, by using electricity. Uh, for example, there is there are many different fields. For example, deep brain stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, and so on. Um, but it's very important also to consider the stimulation waveform because there are different types of stimulation. That is the type of the stimulation that we actually apply on the tissue. Uh, the most basic one would be the monophasic one, as you can see here. But each type of different of stimulation has actually uh, uh, certain advantages and disadvantages. You want a type of a stimulation that in, in, in induces the most action potential, let's say. But uh, we see here in the case of the monophasic that, which is the best for action, inducing action potential, it is also the one that causes the most tissue damage. And therefore we, can, we have to be very careful with that. Um, and, and well, the most optimal one we would see that is the charge imbalance by phasic, which then induces, okay, uh, action potentials, but then it, it induces much less tissue damage and corrosion, which basically causes uh, cell death. Uh, so in this case, this would be the safest one. Um, in order to actually model these types of technologies, we have on the left, we could see the cross section of a peripheral nerve, okay? And around this nerve have been placed high density electrodes. And when we do that, we can see we, this would be the, the voltage, the, the, the voltage uh, potential uh, distribution, let's say. And, and there, in, there is this generated gradient in case of a monopolar stimulation. So whenever we mix this type of uh, electromagnetic uh, simulations with uh, a model of a, of a peripheral nerve where there, are, there have been distributed um, computational neurons, let's say, uh, then we can create this type of graphs which basically tells us uh, the amount of stimulate of current or charge uh, that we need to inject into, a, into an electrode in order to depolarize uh, neurons at specific areas. This is what it, this is, what it is. It is called uh, selective uh, 
neural stimulation, let's say. Um, and it's very important because um, it is not the same if you want to, because certain technologies, especially on electroceuticals, they want to activate neurons at the specific sections or areas within the nerve because its area of the nerve causes, is, 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 uh, it's enervating different parts of the body, let's say. Um, and for example, we see that in spinal cord stimulation and so on. I'm, I'm going to show you another videos uh, in, the, in the next slides. Another important part is the Shannon criteria, which basically tells us the amount of uh, if a if a type of if a specific stimulation will hurt the nerve or not. So it divides the injected charges, which see which we see here, by the area of the electrode, and and then we get the charge density and. If the if the stimulation falls inside of this red area, we know that it's damaged in the brain. It's probably damaged in the brain. So now we come to applications. A very typical, a very inter interesting one is the spinal cord stimulation, which basically here we can see uh, by stimulating the spinal cord, we can innervate uh, skeletal muscles from the legs. A very an example is this video where. We can basically see that a person is getting the spinal cord, the spinal cord scanned, and and once the spinal cord is scanned, they scan the actual, the actual bone, you know, the actual, the the spine, and then basically they can create a correlation by inducing vibrations on the legs to know what's the what what area of the spinal cord is in charge of actually controlling those uh, specific muscles. And, and well, then we create this model of the, taking the model of the, of the spinal cord, they place the electrodes and they make a specific uh, electrode configuration, uh, which, which enables them to know where it should be placed and, and, and also even the intensity of the stimulation. And this is how, where we see that it's displaced and they test the, the neural stimulation with the, activ with the activation. And then this is already been placed. And here we can see how on the left we, ca we have the stimulation, the electrodes getting activated. And here we can see how the actual legs are moved from the person. The, here we are basically, they are basically configuring the type of stimulation and, and well, at the end, you can see how the uh, how the electrodes are programmed and activated. And well, at the end, you can see the person actually moving from the first day that is uh, using this implant. Then there are different types of stimulation. So as that is the case of uh, this is would be electroceuticals that I mentioned before, which is the case of deep brain stimulation, and then they help uh, people patients with Parkinson to to reduce their um, seizures. Let's say. And, and here we can see an example. Uh, this is a person on the left getting the, without, with the DBS uh, device off, which is not working. And on the right, we can see that the, the DBS therapy is on and the person is actually very capable of actually doing like fine movements with their fingers. And this is magic. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not magic, it's science, uh, but uh, it, it looks like magic indeed. indeed. And well, later on, we can see the person actually walking, trying to walk, and it's insane. Like, yeah, it cannot even move and it goes and goes back. All right, so then we move to the ecosystem part. We are getting at the, part, at the end of our presentation almost. Uh, there are these different fields uh, and companies and within the neurotech industry. Whoever is interested in knowing more and, uh, about them, I suggest you to, to go into this uh, website. Um, take a picture, one, two, three, okay. And then I move on to the presentation. Uh, the neuroethics part, I think it's very important to mention because, for example, from the case of phantom limbs, whenever we are starting to induce neural activity into the nervous system, um, it is probably that probable that we can actually um, change the morphology of the nervous system. And therefore, if we, for example, connect a, 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 a limb, a, a bionic limb into a person, that person might develop a, a, a need for that 
same limb. And actually, if you remove the limb of a person, a real limb, that person will feel like phantom limb uh, um, disease, let's say, which basically uh, syndrome, which basically makes that person feel that that limb still it is still in place. So whenever we actually add uh, limbs into person, we will actually be able we, we might cause this dependence to this device. And if, if that device is ever removed, that person could suffer of this uh, syndrome, which is called phantom limb. Every, every once in a while, just ask yourself, are we the bats? And that's it for me. Thanks a lot for your attention. And here you have my contact information in case you want to follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn, or just send me a message to, to my email. And of course, uh, thanks a lot to Petra Eriksson for the illustrations uh, presented throughout this presentation. That's it. Perfect, thank you, Guillem. Fidas had to leave for a moment, so I'm just going to, to say to you that there's a question from Mario De Lorenzo. Do you want to, to answer that question? Uh, sure, let me... So, the question is, how do you deal with foreign body reaction when placing the arrays inside the skull? How do you deal with foreign body reaction when placing electrodes within the skull? I yeah. think, so that's one of the points that were shown at the beginning, which, which there are, well, whenever you inject the charges into an electrode, uh, it is very hard sometimes to, to this, there are different parameters that need to be considered. To be considered, uh, the main two is the type of materials that you are using uh, for that uh, electrode, and then also the, in, to understand how that material behaves with electricity that you are injecting. And, and this would be the main two parts. Probably there are other things to consider, but for sure, first understanding the, that the, the making sure that the material is biocompatible, and second, that understanding how that material behaves with the electricity that you're injecting. And because if you are not, in, if you are, for example, injecting a, a sine wave or a square wave, sorry, uh, of a specific way. Uh, you need to be careful because if you do not compensate the sine, the sine wave, this is what we were saying before on the on the on the presentation, okay? Which is was this part. I suggest you to read this paper that I placed uh, here. So mm -hmm. if you inject charges into the tissue, you need, you, did, you then need to gather them back because if you do not uh, gather them, then you may, you, they, those charges may, may actually oxidize or the, and damage the uh, corro co 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 yeah, cause corrosion on the electrode. And, and then when you cause corrosion on the electrode, then you might actually add uh, metals into the brain tissue and that can cause cell toxicity. So yeah. I hope I have answered your question. Um, if not, send me a message, please. Perfect, Guillem. Vale, so now it's the turn of Victoria Peterson. Uh, Victoria, if you want to share your screen, just to make sure that everything is all right. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. You um, should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, yeah, we see your screen. Perfect. All right. So welcome everybody. I'm super happy to be here presenting our new uh, or the last work that we are working on. Uh, this is uh, the tool is called face cap resonance method for acoustic news artifacts in trochaic and transparency recordings. But I will start with this um, nice picture uh, that I, maybe most of you have already seen it last year when the paper was published. Um, in this paper, the author showed that a person that was not able to, 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 to speak in the last 15 years, a wave of removing, for example, the um, EOG uh, component of the EOG artifact, in which we have our recordings, we learn W, we see how the sources look like, and every sources that 
doesn't seem to be neurophysiological data, we are going to cross it out. That means we are going to put it a zero value in the mixing metrics, and we will be able to go back to the um, traditional the recording, um, the recording space, and we will see a clean version or a denoised version of our recordings. And that's what we want. So similarly to this pipeline, is what we are gonna build and in this um and, I, and I'm gonna explain you in this two in this in the following minutes. So but why we in this moment you mean you mean just to believe me and in the in the by the end of the, the presentation I hope you actually uh, you are convinced if not that you believe me is that since the artifact is channel specific as I tell you before um since the the, the the activity in which we are interested in, that is the dam activity, is, is overlapped with the frequency of appearance of this, um, of this vibration artifact. And I will say, I will be explicit, dam activity between 50 and 250 hertz. And the fundamental frequency of the human voice is between 70 and 180 hertz. That means there's a huge overlap in between the bandwidth of which I am interested if I want to build an encoding or a decoding model for a speech synthesis of disease and vibration artifact set. That's important because we have a similar spectral information in between uh, the different activities. And the activity, uh, while ICA needs independent sources, what we are having here are temporal dependence sources. So we may we may see that maybe these two traditional approaches are not the best. Um, I mean, a scheme or pipeline to apply to our data. So for that, we proposed a new algorithm that we call actually we call a phase coupling decomposition method. Um, this is what I'm gonna try to explain very shortly, but really briefly with this cartoon schematic, in which um, the idea of the phase coupling, the composition pipeline is to rely on spatial filters, okay? So we do have this amplifier space. We do have it. This is how, in a super illustration, uh, illustration how the, the, the traces look like. This is the audio, and this is the IEG. Okay, you see in the temporal trace that this is corrupted, but in the frequency, we can see actually that there is a bump that is following the fundamental frequency of the audio here. This is the audio, recorded audio of the participant. So we have a fundamental frequency. And here we see that there is a bump. Um, and, follow it on the, and the OIEG data is following that bump, which is not what we want. So what we do first um, is visualizing the phase, and we see that what we what we are actually having here is there is a phase relationship different from zero in between the IEG and the audio signal. That means those um, that means that those electrons are corrupted in some sense with the audio of the audio duration artifact. So we want that to be zero. That that will be the idea. Um, so the first thing that we do actually is to we apply uh, an already already well known maybe also spatial filtering approach that is called SSD that comes from spatial spectral decomposition, um, a method that was proposed by Nikulin in 2011. And this method aims at enhancing the signal to noise ratio in a particular frequency of interest. And we are gonna use this, but with two aims, to enhance the signal to noise ratio of our recording across the, uh, the, the bandwidth of the vibration artifact, okay? and also to lo lower down the dimensionality of the problem because we may have a lot of recordings and this is gonna be unfeasible to find the, the sources if we are gonna have as too many recordings to make this um, forward to this background analysis that I was explaining in the beginning. So here we can see that after applying, after applying the, this transformation, it's a linear transformation in which the signal general ratio are around the fundamental frequency of the participant voice had been enhanced. 
we can see the temporal traces of this component, and we can see that here, one of those temporal traces already within the sample is um, this, the, the audio, the audio. This is, a, this is a component. And when we see how the data look like in the frequency domain, we see that there is one and maybe some of them in which actually the power spectrum around the fundamental frequency participant voice have been increased. We are gonna use those, those guys in which are red color code here. We are gonna use them as a starting point to analyze um, and, and make a second uh, step in which we wanna, we are gonna optimize and we are gonna find these sources that are actually in phase, or I would say in another way, I will ask, I will try to, um, to answer the question that which of these sources has the highest task in which we are gonna focus on the onset where the repetition with the triplet must actually be being, being, being done by the, by the participants. Um, this, our, our simulation show that we are able to uh, estimate the sources in this different simulation like really, really nicely. So here the, we have in, in blue the true uh, source and in red the estimated source, but our method they are really in phase. This is anti-phase relationship. We don't care. What we don't care is that they are anti or in phase relationship. And we see that the, the frequency, uh, there is a match uh, in the frequency range that we are interested in. We did a lot of analysis. We analyzed a lot of uh, like um, parameters of, 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 I would say, like different, different configurations of what the, the article may look like. And we found that um, one of the, the, the worst case scenario is when the fundamental, when, when the vibration artifact um, frequency band is too wide, we may not be able to actually estimate the audio as good as we we, to, we, want, we want, right? We did a lot of experiments and this is by using a true audio, this is a true audio, we we simulate we, we actually pick up an audio that is having like a no stationary um you know a pattern i would say here to see if we are able also to capture the no stationarity due to the change of the pitch in the participant so this is this true source and this is the estimated source and we see that nicely if we are able to recover or retrieve um the, the sources in and we have the same I would say, um, shape in temporal frequency and the, and the tem time frequency domain, which is really cool. Um, we find this across different, uh, the across different trial that we estimate, so this is not repeated. And of course, something that we are really interested in is that if we are making the noisy method and we are actually interested in having a clean data so as if I'm gonna build a BCI decoding model, I can rely on what I'm having it's not that actually I'm having a biased decoder due to the audio itself. Um, what I want also to know is that I am not making, I am not, you know, producing any trouble in the actually gamma activity decoder, I would say neurophysiological data in which I'm interested in. So we did this experiment and this is a simulation because we needed the run through signal, so like, the, 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 the true signal without the, any noise. Then we have the noisy signal in which we linearly combined the data with the audio. And then we apply CAR, we apply ICA, and this is our method. So this is how the signal looks like in the temporal domain. When we look in the, the power spectrum domain, we see what we expect, that there is a broad, you know, uh, gamma activity happening uh, happening, and this is in the onset of the speech, that is what we expect to see. But when we have noisy signal, there's uh, the appearance of this bump that we, are, we don't want. When we apply CARP, the bump is actually stronger. When we apply CE, ICA, there is, um, there is a, it seems to be, data, it does seem to be clean. And when we apply our method, data is completely clean. This, auto, this also can be seen in the phase domain. That's actually how we assess the, 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 the vibration artifact um, appearance. 
And interesting, we also try to show if there is no change with respect to the novel activity. And for that, we, we took the ground average and every that the, the artifact was being nicely removed. And when they are aware um, gram activity, data was not being, you know, uh, jeopardized. So the, the, the take home message that mechanical vibration of the signal can interfere the recording brain signal activity. And this is also happening in over the speech experiment with surface EEG. So take that in account. There are two papers that show this, so go and check them. That we can rely on the phase locking value to measure the vibration of the contamination. And that what I have shown you here is the first algorithmic solution for thinning this type of artifacts. Um, that, of course, there is a, a, a strong correlation in between the performance of PCE and having a true uh, source uh, contamination. This is something that we need to look at in the future. But uh, also, I want to highlight here uh, that maybe traditional processing pipelines are not, the, are not in the best fit for, for um, working with this data. So I will say that this is a work, it's a collaboration. I did this work when I was making my postdoc in, in MGH, in the Brain Modulation Lab at the Harvard Medical School. And this is uh, was nicely being done by the old collaborators, Matteo, Alan, and Mark. Um, and also we'll say this is uh, under, this, is, this, this work is under construction. Uh, we hope to submit it really, really soon, this paper, so stay tuned. Because if you wanna, if you wanna know, or maybe you want to write the code to do this analysis and your experiments, the codes are gonna be there, are gonna be out. And this is me. I am Victoria Peterson. I am a, an Argentinian investigator, a professor, a professor at Instituto de Matemática Aplicada Litoral in Argentina, and I am a collaborator of uh, the Brain Modulation Lab at the MCH and Harvard Medical School. So I hope you have enjoyed, and I'm open to any question that you may have. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Victoria. I think we have one. Well, I think that the question was from from the previous presentation. Um, I don't think we have any questions here. So um, thanks again, and I think uh, we will just move to the next speaker, which is Milena. Milena, do you want to try to put your camera on, see if it works? It says that the host stopped it. Hello. Yes. No, now, we can see now, you. Now yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much for your kind. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Let me share my screen. So yeah, I, I think um, you you know what's next. So the next hour is yours, um, and we're all ears. Uh, yes, I, I was considering half an hour, but I did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, we'll have some questions, I hope. Uh, yes, okay, okay. No, I have more slides, but that, that's that's fine. With no, me. take your time. I mean, we have we have one one hour in terms of slot, okay. so that's okay. between presentation and questions. Uh, you can take okay. your, all the time you need. Yeah, that sounds great. Now, thank you again very much for this amazing invitation and possibility to... Um, be here and uh, let me begin and uh, it, it is more general presentation and overview especially an overview of the possibilities for um, neurotech uh, in uh, clinical applications and i also will mention possibilities for education and especially career opportunities in this field because this opportunity lies so here i would like to show you a team with uh, with which i worked for a number of years to demonstrate how uh, different specialties are working together people from different specialties are joining their efforts uh, to provide services for patients and uh, all of them are contributing to uh, the use of neurotechnologies for that treatment 
Um, so you can see here neurologist, epileptologist, child uh, neurologist, neurosurgeon, neuropsychologist, neurophysiologist, uh, neuroscientist, uh, and uh, this is the clinical team. Of course, many collaborators, um, uh, one of them, Dr. Shock, uh, electrical engineer, uh, computer scientist. Uh, then we have collaborators from computer vision, machine learning, uh, Dr. Bakchi. We have physical therapists specifically specializing in neuro rehabilitation. And uh, of course, we need to develop various paradigms. And I will tell you later uh, why we need that. And here we have an amazing collaborator, for example, Dr. Salinas, uh, Salias, uh, who is cognitive uh, psychologist and also linguist. So, and of course, electrical engineering, entrepreneurs, uh, those who are providing us equipment and support. And uh, uh, here, of course, um, we, we uh, are working a lot with Dr. Guger and his company. So, uh, epilepsy, uh, why epilepsy and how uh, neurotechnologies are content here. You can see that already post-surgical picture with the removed substrate. So everything seems to be really straightforward. Yes, we uh, localized, however, it was difficult. We made it possible to localize activity. And now we're simply removing the tissue that is generating that abnormal activity. But it is not as straightforward as it might look like, because we know that different parts of the brain are associated with certain function. We cannot just remove some part of the brain and hope that the person will be okay. Yes, so we of course has, have language related substrates and for expressive language like Broca's and receptive language like Wernicke's and we have motor related um, uh, cortex and we have vision uh, related areas in the occipital um, uh, cortex. So we have uh, areas that might overlap with the seizure uh, activity uh, or seizure activity um, uh, substrate uh, related generating substrate. And we need to be aware of that. And here is an example of how this can happen. For example, here uh, by using electrocarticography, we uh, found that these particular areas are uh, being involved in uh, generating seizure activity. So, however, we also found, found out that the adjacent area of the brain, which is over here, yes, if you see frontal is on the, on your, uh, this will help you not to get lost. Lost, uh, it will save you time, uh, money, energy, and uh, make you to progress with your career much faster. So in conclusions, Adaptive neurotechnologies can be successfully utilized for treatment of pharmacoresistant epilepsy through neuromodulation and surgery, both preoperatively and intraoperatively. Um, second, clinical implementation and application of adaptive neurotechnologies requires interdisciplinary collaboration so people from all fields can join the effort. And you can join the clinical neurotech field from any discipline. And then courses and trainings are available, but need to be chosen on individual basis. And I want to invite all of you to listen to Neuro Careers podcast, where, where we uh, actually are finding out how to join the field of neuroscience and neurotech from virtually any discipline. And also, you can share your experience. So uh, please contact me with any questions. Uh, I'm always open to collaboration and open to help uh, anybody who needs it. So thank you so much. And questions, I'm open for questions. 
Well, thank you very much. That was uh, actually the second one hour. That was great. Uh, that has covered a lot, a lot of uh, topics that we already have had like questions on. Uh, we, we have one question from one person. Um, okay, awesome. We have one question from one person here saying, it's the first time I, I work with neurotech hardware, where should they go next? Like the first thing you should learn uh, just from the beginning. Uh, I, I just hear the signal a little interrupting. Um, uh, for, from which which field the person is joining? Yeah, so he's a designer he, and he has a no design. experience in your tech. So he's just asking where should he go first? Okay, that's a good question. And probably uh, uh, I would like to get more details. Uh, maybe you can contact me directly. So it's not something I will be charging you or anything. No, I, I will be happy to discuss and give you a direction. Not problem at all. I guess so probably it will be easier. I, I will ask more designer and what the person is doing and so on and so forth. So yeah, it, it will not fit right now in, in this uh, context. But for I'm sure. for everybody help. else who's, who's listening to, to this, we already shared the list of resources that has uh, some neurotech courses and some starter kits and some codes and some experiments and tutorials that uh, we definitely recommend you look at. Um, and then I think now it's time to move to our next speaker, uh, who's, uh, who's waiting in Paris. We have two speakers from Paris. We have Marie and we have uh, Silva coming next in the next hour. So uh, if you can unmute yourself and it's, we don't hear you. Hello. Hello, hello. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on your time zone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present this work, and especially. Uh, Marie, before you start. Sorry? Before you start, we just want to ask you, how's it going in Paris? Very well. I mean, it's not too much cloudy for once. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm French, I'm mean, into that. But, well, it's quite uh, interesting to see all these uh, projects uh, going on. So That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I just I just want to, to, to get a glimpse of what's happening in, in, in Paris. And it's really amazing to be connecting from Barcelona to Belgrade to Munich to Paris seeing everybody doing some action. So I just don't want to take from your time. That was it. Just want to say hi. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Great. So, thank you. Uh, so hi again. <laughs> so um, yes, here I'm going to present some elements to give you some food for thought about ways of improving non-invasive brain computer interfaces. And especially I'm interested in trying to uh, use both multimodal and relational information to improve that. Um, so as is written in my slide, I'm Marie-Constance Corsi. I'm currently a scientist at Aramis Lab here in Paris. Um, and so I will try to check the chat box if you have any questions, so feel free to accept me. I will try to check that. So let's start. Um, first of all, about a non-invasive brain computer interface or BCI. I guess most of you are uh, super aware of that, just to uh, do some recap about that. Um, so it consists in trying to translate the brain activity into commands for control or communication. And among uh, the most uh, useful steps, uh, we will start first by uh, recording the brain activity. So in the case of non-invasive brain computer interface, you're going to use most of the time the electroencephalography because it's a gold standard and supportable and super useful. But in this presentation, I will be also interested to show you uh, ways to use uh, magnetoencephalography or MEG. It consists in trying to um, measure the magnetic field generated by the brain. Um, and it's a very tiny apertus, as you can see here. Um, so once you have uh, recorded the brain activity, you can extract the information of interest uh, called features and um, burst dynamics uh, observed in EEG and MEG. We were able to elicit features that were okay observed at the group level, but um, 
also like very reliable features that you can observe in most of the subjects. So that was a very important point in, uh, in our opinion. So for that, uh, I'd like to thank our main uh, contributors and institutions that helped us to work and you for your attention. If you have any question, let me know and feel free to use the chat box. Are you still there? <laughs> In any case, you have my email contact and Twitter account. So uh, feel free to write me if you have any question about this presentation or if you want to get in touch afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So there are no more questions. I propose to switch to Sylvain. Oh, Firas, we can see you. I have myself muted by mistake, I'm sorry. Okay, that's better. So we, I mean, for now, like there's no questions from the audience. Um, maybe we move to Sylvain already? Sorry? Maybe we should move to Silva? Ah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Perfect. <laughs> I'll give you the floor. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Là, tu partages quoi? Là, tu partages l'écran. Arrêtez l'écran. Ouais. By the way, I have to say that we have someone from the 32 school in Barcelona as well. Uh, Mia, who's here? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, we have someone from the 42 school here as well. He's, he's supporting with mentoring some teams. So it's cool to have sure. the connection. Yeah. Cool. Euh, euh, tu as un browser en écoute. Ouais, je suis dans un navigateur. Ok. Mm. Uh, and by the way, uh, are you guys connected with Olivier? Uh, with Olivier? Yes. He, he... He will uh, he will make a presentation afterwards, no? Exactly after you. Yeah. yeah uh, we just want to make sure that we, we contact him to make sure he's connected and coming in time. Okay, okay. I I think he's connecting from his home. Um, okay. So yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So let me share my screen. Okay. Yes, and uh, yeah, sorry for the interruption. Uh, yeah, I'll resume. Uh, okay, uh, yes, and okay. So, do you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry, yeah, sorry for the introduction. So, yeah, I was just telling you uh, that one important. Uh, thing was that my previous lab in Versailles was really crowded with old gears and old hardware and I really wanted to avoid um, leaving many hardware like that or uh, past experiment that are not used anymore so I was kind of uh, happy to be able to give a second life to uh, my uh, experiment so i did some uh, mental and um, around the around the ear on the temporal uh, electrode because 
uh, the signal is very strong. And uh, in the uh, artistic installation, we ask the person to really focus their mind on the butterfly they want. And it gives a feedback um, by the way of a sound. So each uh, butterfly is associated with a sound, like a, 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 a small, uh, a nice bell, or some uh, uh, the, the noise of the wind, or uh, the noise of um, of a fountain or a cascade uh, nearby. So these are the kind of feedback you obtain when you concentrate more on one butterfly or another. So I reused the stuff that Marie Constance Corsi uh, just uh, described in her talk about uh, Riemannian geometry and uh, using uh, robust uh, BCI. So it was very nice to have this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of way to interact with the with the public. Um, this is something slow. People need to take their time to um, to relax and to focus on the the butterfly they want to hear. Uh, and um, it's very nice because uh, you could uh, you could see how people are trying to focus and uh, when they. Uh, find or not uh, the ability to uh, to make one sound more uh, uh, more present in the uh, audio landscape. So this was very uh, very nice uh, experiment to conduct with uh, with Mafloe. So we presented this uh, so this uh, three uh, three butterflies uh, based on SSVP in uh, various environment. Uh, I think in uh, in to be as autonomous as possible. So it's a real challenge to uh, to think of uh, something like that. So I will uh, finish here. Uh, I hope that it will give you some time before the next presentation. I think uh, we discuss here with uh, Romain about uh, maybe a small break, uh, if it's uh, possible. So um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. I will be uh, happy to uh, answer your question now or afterwards uh, online. Uh, my, um, yeah, my, uh, my email is uh, is easily available uh, if you type um, Sylvain Chevalier research. I think you will find my uh, my contact information. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have questions right now, I could uh, answer them. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I will uh, leave. Uh, I will uh, give the floor back. Uh, okay, I saw there was some uh, chat. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the 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 IP is public. Uh, this it's uh yeah it's uh it's no problem to show the IP. Yeah. Um. Okay. So Firas, if you want to take back the floor, it's okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Is that yeah. good? Yeah, we're changing the devices. We're changing devices. That's why we we couldn't be connected. So is uh, Olivier joining here? Sorry. Do you know if Olivier is joining us here? Uh, yeah, he will be joining us. We have given him uh, some uh, links to okay. uh, to connect and uh, yeah. Okay, so I think we're just going to wait until he shows up. Okay. So I know that, uh, yeah, here uh, Romain talk about some, um, some maybe make a, a little break. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah, okay, it's a three minute break, but. <laughs> until, until, until Olivier shows up. 
until Olivier shows up. Okay. And, and do you want to be presenting Olivier as well, or? Um, I think no. If it's okay, I. Uh, okay, sure. I'll just I, wait for him uh, to show up. Yeah. Seems to uh, to monitor today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Super. thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so okay. Goodbye. <laughs>
should we or could we? We're not magicians. No one is objective. We're just people who are choosing to use a methodology rather than another, that are choosing a statistical threshold than, than another, that are choosing a bunch of subjects or protocols in order to test our hypothesis, our hypothesis, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess uh, it's pretty clear from the, you know, from now on that what I'm going to share with you is a mix of my experience and my opinion. And I hope a lot of people are gonna disagree, even if deep inside, of course, like many of us, I think I'm right, but that's my problem, not yours. So um, neuroethics and neuro rights. It's really important for me to share where I come from. Um, I did the whole thing that I was told as a, a, a student, you know, I PhD and the trans and the papers, and I went for a postdoc, and then I was assistant, associate, full prof, and then I look back, I'm like, wow, am I going to do that for another 30 years? Nah. So I started to, to think about uh, other things, but as a, as a, as a, a teacher and a researcher in the, the public sector, um, I, I created the first class in neuroethics in France, and we're talking almost 20 years ago. Uh, why did I do that? Because when I was a um, when I was a um, a student uh, as a postdoc, actually a postdoc, I wrote a piece in 2003 about neuromarketing, and no one was writing about neuromarketing in Europe. It was an op-ed in Le Monde, uh, a big French uh, newspaper. And um, when I wrote that, uh, I had the the National Ethics Committee that reached out to me and say, "Hey, young man, literally, um, uh, would you like to come and?" Uh, and talk to us at our next event. And I uh, said, I'm sorry, I'm in postdoc. I don't have the luxury in terms of time and of money to fly back to France to speak. But I promise you that when I get back to France, I will come and speak to you guys. So here I am, a few years later, invited by all these guys that I had read, ethicists, philosophers, and sitting in the middle of them, sharing with them what my vision was on uh, back then, so I was doing fMRI um, on neuroscience and neuroethics. This led to an invitation that changed my life. I was invited to speak at the French Parliament because the French Parliament started to be interested as early as 2007 in the questions related to neuroscience and ethics. And you know why they got interested? Because two Parliament members found an op-ed in the New York Times that was not reporting on MRI results, but I was a report on MRI results. And that is a very, very uh, important nuance, meaning that it was not a journalist that went to a lab and decided that uh, we should, uh, uh, they should write about some cool stuff that is doing, uh, being done with neuroimaging. But it was actually researchers that published their results in the New York Times about some MRI recording, fMRI recordings on people that voted in the primary for the 2008 uh, election in the US. And the French parliament members got scared and decided to gather a bunch of, of scientists. And in the room for this gathering at the French parliament had only members of the French Academy of Science and me. Uh, the first thing one can notice is there was no one that was non-French. Uh, the second thing is really back then I was young uh, and I was the youngest. And at some point, someone uh, made a comment that was very accurate scientifically, but totally disconnected from reality when it comes to society, saying that neuromarketing was BS. Uh, it was uh, just uh, a buzz and we shouldn't be talking about it at the parliament. And I said, hey, this is like your opinion, man. Already I was quoting the big Lebowski for those of you who are, who are familiar with the, with the movie. I uh, was saying, yeah, that's your opinion. But the one thing you can't deny is whether it works or not is almost irrelevant to this conversation. First, because what does it works mean? But that's a whole different thing. Uh, there is a business in the US that has emerged and that has been running since 1999 uh, and uh, the first one we heard in the US was uh, in, uh, in Atlanta, um, a company that was partnering with Emory University. Uh, and the business exists 
So if a business exists, it means that there are people who are asking for it and who are paying for it. And hence, we should talk about it. And this is how I got really into thinking about neuroethics. Uh, one thing led to another. I was offered by the French Prime Minister of France to lead a, pro a program that was a world first called Neuroscience and Public Policy. And, and the goal was to understand whether we can improve uh, prevention in public health, uh, engagement of people towards sustainability, uh, understand development or the effect of cognitive aging or video games on the brain uh, in the context of a public policy um, program. Uh, what this program did as well was to participate in what would become uh, the first um, piece of law that integrated neuroscience ever, the French bioethics laws and its revisions. So in 2011, France became the very first um, country uh, to change its law to integrate a part on neuroscience. And that should have been the biggest achievement of my life, at least in, in policy making back then, and it became the biggest failure. I was in charge of a lot of work on this, uh, on those two, that would lead to these two paragraphs. We auditioned and talked and worked with so many experts that were all, all agreeing, which was uh, a bit surprising when you know human nature, but that was the case. Um, all agreeing that, um, there was no ground to prevent the private sector from using neuroscience, which was one of the asks from some parliament members, but there were high, you know, strong concerns to be using neuroimaging in particular in courts because of the problems with being able to replicate the results and the balance that you need to have that the methodology could serve equally whomever accuses, but also whomever defends. Um, at the end of the day, um, after many backs and forth between parliament, the Senate, et cetera, a couple of words were changed. And the French, um, the, those two paragraphs in the French law uh, relating to neuroscience read that neuroimaging with no other precision or detail should be uh, only used for scientific and medical purposes. That was the formulation, the phrasing, for some people to try to prevent neuroimaging to be used in the private sector. The same people that years before had agreed for um, a lot of other scientific fields to be used in the private sector, but somehow they wanted an exception for neuroimaging. And then the second part of uh, the law opened the doors wide open for neuroimaging to be used in courts. And it's very interesting because at the end of the day, what the law reads, if you take it, you know, word for word, is almost the opposite of what all the experts have been saying uh, for three years as part of a program that, uh, that we run to help the government uh, come up with this law. So yeah, huge failure. And also a wake up call realizing that if it happens in my field, I mean, that's very pretentious of me to say my field, but the field that I study and where I know people, et cetera, uh, I started to imagine uh, what could have happened in other fields, you know, uh, decisions about nuclear plants or things like that. It's like, wow, interesting. The, 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 there were people that were much, much more qualified than me. Uh, whose opinion was totally dismissed in this process. Well, interesting. But at the end of the day, uh, France became the, the first country to have a, a public policy program that was dedicated to neuroscience for four, four years and to change its law about uh, neuro, neuroscience and, and neuroethics and to consider neuroethics uh, at the very uh, least. And I guess that if there was something positive that uh, this this law, despite how upset I was at the personal level and many other people about the, 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 the phrasing and how it was written, is at least we were thinking about the societal implications of what we're doing as neuroscientists. Um, this, uh, the interesting thing is uh, it took 10 years uh, for France to revise again the, the part related to neuroscience. And I guess uh, we don't learn about our lesson because now um, 
the, uh, the, the, the text, um, the legal text in France reads that uh, some people have the authority to stop um, companies, organizations uh, that uh, create a solution that will change the brain. It's very interesting when you think about it because it, it gives a power to um, some medical authority in, in that case to halt efforts that could be made by pharmaceutical companies because they alter the brain. But then there is the irony of these people not understanding, understanding how the brain works. And uh, you might have gotten by now that I'm a little bit facetious. So my first comment was, okay, so we should ban the law because just reading the law and reading what you wrote is changing my brain. So, hey, why don't we just ban the law? Um, not to mention that little uh, humor or trait of, of spirit was not very well received on the, uh, the lawmakers end. More seriously, um, France was not the first country where there was a, lo a lot of reflection. We ran some work on neuroscience and the law, but way before us, there was an organization in the US, the MacArthur Foundation, that had an amazing initiative on neuroscience and the law and uh, the implications of some of the techniques that we fancy, some of the algorithms, some of the hardware, um, some of the way we process information. Mm could be used in courts. And uh, this is, uh, I encourage you to, to have a look at what the MacArthur Foundation has been doing. Um, long story short and jumping to more recent events uh, in Chile uh, and in, um, uh, sorry, in Greece, there is a huge effort, including a neural rights foundation that is working to protect people's neural rights because and again i'm going to be very biased here so please have a look at the, the documents from the neural rights foundation who did an extremely uh important research work etc i might not agree with you know some of the of the conclusions they come come up to but uh, i given that they did a tremendous amount of work uh considering neurotechnologies uh, as a potential threat to our human rights. So now neuro, neuro uh, science and uh, neurotech is moving into the neuro rights health. And it's very interesting to see how the narrative is put. I was sitting in, uh, at an event earlier this year in Geneva um, where someone from the Neuro Rights Foundation was uh, presenting the report a few days after it was released and uh, mentioning something that made me smile at the beginning and not so much at the end, that uh, neurotechnologies could be used in order to uh, put thoughts in people's minds, et cetera. And that person, in order to present that, was in uh, within three minutes, used the word neurotechnologies with the word torture and comparing it to what had been done in neural rights with torture. Uh, six times in three minutes, neurotech and torture, neurotech and torture, I'd raise my hand, couldn't help, you know, how I am and say, hey, you just gave us the proof that no one, you, you don't need a, uh, an EEG, a portable neurotech, you know, that you put uh, thoughts in people's minds just by saying neurotech and torture uh, several times in a, in a few minutes. Uh, this is exactly what you did. Um, and, and I think that, that, is, that is part of what we need to be careful about. Um, uh, there are lots of uh, initiatives at the moment uh, across the world. So at the United Nations, at the UNESCO, um, I think uh, we got the OECD that, is, uh, that has been doing a lot of work over the, the past years, several governments. There is also an initiative at, called JESDA. It's, um, it's based in Geneva, and uh, I've been part of, of their work recently on trying to, to work on what could be a framework to help public and private organizations navigate the neurotech space. And I encourage you guys, uh, if you got a bit of time, 
uh, to not only just to read, but to, to get involved. Because here are the things that I, I think, in my opinion, are important to, to think about uh, what we do. Of course, there is data. There is data protection over questions about uh, anonymity of data or not, uh, about the fact that one day we'll be able to find things that uh, people don't know and what do we do uh, about, about our findings. Uh, these are questions that I think every scientist manipulating data, health data, should be uh, asking himself or herself. That every entrepreneur that is working with med tech at the broader sense and for that, the point of that conversation, I would put neurotech into med tech, even if some of our applications are not medical. What are you going to do with the data? There are very strong regulatory constraints, fortunately, uh, to protect data, etc. But I think we can still move forward with that. The second thing is, uh, is more problematic to me, is the fact that in a lot of these commissions or committees, et cetera, I see two uh, major issues. The first one is I've been around enough to be invited in a lot of these committees. And I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting, listening to people who have zero training in neuroscience or never been an entrepreneur or never used portable uh, neurotech telling in the near future, this is going to happen. In the near future, this is going to happen. And if there was one com common thing about everything they were talking about is everything they thought was about the future had already happened five or 10 years uh, before, uh, from mind controlling a vehicle to exoskeleton to predictive analytics about people's behavior or consumers' behavior, etc. So you got a bunch of folks generally that are not very updated about what is happening in real life. And by real life, um, I'm doing this on purpose. I mean, outside uh, scientific and medical labs that are trying to set agendas that are some, you know, gener generally it's, let's be afraid of what is gonna happen, but hey guys, uh, where is the industry? The industry is not sitting uh, around the table. And I feel super comfortable saying that because, of course, now people are saying, hey, well, they were saying, hey, you're the guy from Emotive. And now you're the guy from Inclusive Brains. You're the guy from the private sector. Of course, you want the private sector around the table. But this is where I say, and that's the privilege of age and experience, I say, hey, guys, may I refer to you uh, to this paper I wrote 15 years ago when I was 100% in academia making no money in the private sector. And when I was saying exactly what I said now, that we need to sit down with the industry, that if you really want to regulate properly a sector, every stakeholder should be consulted and participating in the conversation from NGOs to science, to medicine, to patient organizations, to users association, to the industry, et cetera, et cetera, lawmakers. Um, so that's that's uh, point number one. Uh, it's the fact that a uh, bunch of these people uh, have no experience and are uh, trying to paint a cataclysmic use of what we're doing, uh, discussing a lot more the risks than the benefits of neurotech for society. And you might say, hey, dudes, you're exaggerating. You're making a generalization. Yes, I am. But again, uh, please do not take my word. Go and read the reports. Go and read the minutes of some of the, the, these commissions, and you'll see that you might agree with me that there is more about the risk than the benefits. The other, the, the, the other point I wanted to share is the fact that very often neurotechnologies are considered at, uh, as one big monolith. And um, people are talking about neurotechnology singular. So of course, some of you might think, okay, this is the uh, old Olivia kicking back the academy. You know, we like semantics. We like to talk about, you know, going nitty gritty on the words and things like that. But I think it's super important. If you want to regulate, I've been on the side of a regulator working on policy making. I'm sorry, um, you can't regulate devices that monitor brain activity the same way you would regulate devices that affect 
brain activity and change it with TDCS or TMS, etc. These are they, they belong to the big family of neurotechnologies, plural, but when it comes to regulating them for use outside medical and scientific environment, it's a totally different story for me and for a lot of people. And then again, this comes, uh, this kind of approach as a monolith, neurotechnology with a Y at the end, a singular, comes from a lack of knowledge and maybe a lot of work a lack of work on understanding the plurality, the diversity of everything we do. And I would encourage you guys to really uh, take the time to think about what you're doing. Um, we got examples of people in big tech companies that have resigned, not in neurotechnology, but in, in other sectors, because they did not agree with what the algorithms that we're working on would be used for and it's our responsibility to, to think about that too. When Paul and I founded Inclusive Brains, yes, uh, we agreed on, on, I mean, we're passionate about neurotech, neuroscience, helping people, uh, helping people with disabilities, uh, with neurotechnologies. But the one thing we agreed upon at the very beginning were the values, what we wanted to do and, and to whom we wanted to help, et cetera. And, and I think that's important. The values part is not just poetry. It's not just words. It's, okay, what are your values? What do you want to do? What, think about what uh, the, the, you put your brain power at. And the final, uh, the final point is related to what we're doing with inclusive brands and, uh, and other companies are working uh, on at the moment. It's more on the algorithmic aspects the digital twin of a brain at some point when uh, we, we will have a network of, of algorithms that can really mimic how the brain uh, works, at least or some brain function works, either to test drugs or predict uh, or read and predict behavior. And these uh, algorithms that we built that will maybe know better how people make decisions or in advance, and they will make decisions themselves when the algorithms that we build make decisions, uh, what is the responsibility of people who code um, on the impact they have on society? Uh, I will stop here. I'm, I hope very sincerely that I gave you zero answers and that I just, without the help of any brain device, put a bunch of questions in your head. Once again, thank you so much for um, inviting me and, and for uh, giving me your most precious um, asset, your attention, I hope, and your time. And again, I'm so into this thing that I can't wait to see what all the participants around the world have come up to uh, in this uh, hackathon. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me, Olivier? I can hear you. Awesome. That's very good. So, I mean, I, I want to stop on the first thing you said about the subjectivity and the objectivity. I, I don't know if you can see me, right? So. No, I can't. I, I, I could see you. Now I can see you, but I could see you back then. And unless I'm totally mistaken, your body language was screaming that you were kind of agreeing with what I say. But... Maybe I yes, misinterpreted. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was agreeing. Wait, wait, I mean, a lot, and I think we can we can linger on this a bit uh, and maybe explain it a bit more with with all this. I mean, now everything we, we listen to is uh, I mean, using a lot to the word data back decisions, data back to whatever, data back to whatever, you know, uh, mm -hmm. evidence based whatever, evidence based whatever. I mean, and as if, like, if something is baked with data, then it's thematically making sense, right? Maybe you want to talk us a bit more about this in your experience. Yeah. And I, I think, once again, I don't, I don't want to sound like an academic, I mean, uh, um, and, and be too boring, but here, too, words matter. Uh, there is evidence-based and evidence-informed decision. There is, uh, again, data-based and data-informed uh strategy. And I think this is very important because uh, 
it's the difference between something being automated and something where humans are using technology in order to assist them into decision making. Other sectors where um, the algorithms uh, perform better than humans, oh, come on, so many of them, and not just mechanical ones, I would say. We could, uh, I mean, uh, I got moles on my, on my, I don't know if you can see my arm, I got moles on my arm and I got a friend of mine who, uh, who founded a company that uh, with 4K, the, the day 4K cameras uh, were mainstream on, on phones, they could analyze it better than any human. I've, uh, con I've consulted for a company called Arteries that was doing contours on, on uh, medical imaging, heart imaging at the beginning, and then they did lungs and brains, et cetera, uh, in, in, in one second. And we, uh, when it was taking 40 minutes to a human to do that, et cetera. And, and we can go into more complex things. I mean, the Go game or uh, the fact that it's now admitted that it's impossible for a uh, human to beat a computer at chess unless the human is equipped with some technology that he hides in parts of a body that we don't want to discuss here for those who follow the, uh, the chess, uh, the, the, the whole chess drama recently. If you haven't, uh, please do. It's quite interesting. Um, so at the end, I'd say um, it all depends whether in your business, in the science, in policy, in your NGO, um, a human is making the last call, meaning literally having to make a decision, looking at data and then making a call because there is uncertainty or whether the human is just pressing the button that the algorithm is telling you to press. This is an image, of course. Uh, I would say a, a, an example uh, that I always find fascinating is surgery to me. Yeah. Uh, great, great. You can learn surgery. You can teach robots to do fantastic surgery. And I would say that for some surgery, if I have to undergo surgery, again, my opinion, I'd rather a robot to do it, if it's uh, a benign surgery, et cetera, than a human. Now, if I got a huge um, problem in my brain and I'm in neurosurgery today, I still prefer a human. And having talked a lot uh, and done some very meta experiment, not meta the company, but you'll see, we recorded the brain of neurosurgeons when they were operating on people's brains. So that's what I call meta, uh, trying to understand and, and also um, uh, eye tracking and, uh, and other metrics, uh, just to, to understand what kind of information they pick up, et cetera. Um, what was fascinating when talking to top surgeons is to say that every time they've been saving lives when people thought there would be deaths, they did not follow the playbook. They followed the legal, the, the, et cetera, but they had to think about tactics, about something to do that they did not learn. That came from experience that was counterintuitive. Um, I, I often say that, um, you know, intuition is experience in disguise. Uh, they had the right intuition based on years of experience. So the thing that is fascinating to me, and this is why I've been talking uh, a lot to these people, um, Formula One drivers, you know, people who are doing extreme things, uh, people who are uh, piloting jets, I mean, big mass uh, geniuses, uh, field medals, et cetera. I mean, I'll stop here. But the point is not to drop names, but to say that those people, uh, they have intuition. And I'm I'm very fascinated by now that we can model some brain functions, when will we be able to have our girls that can do these kind of intuition, intuitive things? I think that's reasonable to, to think it's not impossible because if a person does it, maybe an algo, a bunch of our girls are going to be able to, to do it. But it's beyond the function itself. It's beyond just the fact that we are predicting what the next move at chess is going to be. It's okay. Pardon my French, but shit is hitting the fan big time. What are you going to do? And, and this is the part where uh, evidence-informed is better than evidence-based. 
Yeah, because I mean, for, I for mean, now, for now, for now. Yeah, no, but like from my perspective as well, I think that like everything can be kind of encoded, if but it's just that we're not there yet, right? Yeah, and and there is also uh, again, it's a more philosophical uh, question: is do we want to be there? Um, I think, I mean, well, from my it, perspective is, first, I mean, the, the only way not to be there for me is to be able to be there and choose not to. Otherwise, we're lost. Yeah, but you know also that history of science and technology shows you that if you're there, it's going to be used. Yeah, of course. You but, have but a choice. You have a choice. Thing. Yeah, but you have a choice, but you don't have a choice. You have the theoretical choice, but the choice is made because it's going to be used. Yeah, but like there's. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, but yeah, this is something I've been experiencing lately. With I mean, we're doing a lot of metaverse stuff at the moment, and then uh -huh. uh, like I, I have this discussion a lot, and then my my final conclusion is that if if you're not uh, if you're not around the dinner table, you're on the menu. So it's it's not about like. Um, hey. It reminds me of neuromarketing, man. Uh, yeah, people, yeah. Neuromarketing I, I, see, I see. I see. Listen, I I, I see. I see so many uh, articles, uh, uh, just like you guys, I'm sure, about what is happening to Meta and their shares and uh, and everything and the value, etc. And you're like, uh, okay. Uh, and and some of these articles are very negative about the metaverse. I'm like, guys, we're talking about billions that are invested, not just by Meta, but um, a lot of my clients. I'm not going to share the brands, but some in construction, in the automotive industry, some yeah. in uh, professional services, they all invest to build uh, at least offices in the metaverse without knowing where they're going most of the time. And this is why they're, they're working with us also. But the fact that so much money is being spent means yeah. that there is a business and it's a form of reality. Number one, the second thing, and this is where being super biased is, is say, guys, you can do whatever you want. You can keep on fighting for the hair to be as realistic as you want in the freaking metaverse. But my, my, my problem is not that. It's as long as the metaverse is not going to be able to sense people, um, you're going to be able to use uh, a couple of joysticks in order to smile. Maybe not with a, the, the, the Quest Pro now that has eye tracking. But yeah, yeah no, but at some point, we will need to have the environment being able to read people and to predict people. And this is what we're working on with a digital twin of a user's brain is to empower machines to sense us. If a machines don't sense us, let me give you one problem that I was not interested as a, a PhD student. Just going back to the end of the 90s, I moved to Cincinnati during my, my PhD and the guy I was working with in human factors was the king and still is the king of motion sickness. And he wanted me to work on motion and sickness. And I was like, ah, I'm not interested. Uh, was doing posture stuff, et cetera. Now, yeah. yeah, now, listen, 20 years later, motion sickness is one of the hottest topic whenever you put a headset on people and everyone wants to understand what they've been doing, what to do. And it's super interesting to see that if you don't close the loop, if you do not empower the, the, the device and the machines, to sense people's physiological and cognitive and affective uh, dynamics and to adapt in real time, well, there'll be big problems starting that people are gonna puke. I mean, a significant amount of people are puking when they spend more than half an hour immersed. And you know, it's very that this reminds me of another thing, which is people used to puke when they go on airplanes, right? And yeah, you yeah. still in now, like now, the archaeology of this is that we only have the bags in the planes that you can puke in. Nobody pukes, right? Mm. And I have the same <laughs> intuition about what's going to happen in VR that people are having sickness, and then we're going to still have the idea, but nobody's going to have sickness very, very soon. And, and yeah, what... but, but but again, it's it's novelty. It's novelty, but it's interesting to see that we're thinking. I mean, a lot of people who are self-proclaimed metaverse experts. Yeah. Or future, or futurist, etc. I mean, uh, we could talk about the futurist case. That's another one, which is a good ethical question as well. I'll but tell you, I'll, a great I'll point in terms to add to your, to your, the list is future proof. <laughs> no, so but there's a lot of future proof I, businesses. So uh, Paul hates me saying that, my co-founder, but I'm a, I'm a huge geek at heart. I mean, uh, I love figures and data for everything. So of course, when, and I'm on the speaking tour, 
doing well on the speaking tour, but I started to see this futurist, you know, I sharing the stage with a futurist. And, you know, when you're the guy who comes and, and helps someone with uh, very little training, take off a drone and land with just a BCI, and you're pretty, you know, generally you're the, you're the person of interest. And then there is a futurist that comes that has zero experience in science, zero experience in tech, zero experience in entrepreneurship. And that is telling the future and people are listening to this guy. You're like, ah, okay, what did I miss? So I started to analyze and out of the top 30 futurists on the speaking tour in the US, and, and you might say, hey, speaking tour, who cares? No, 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 no. These people are not just speaking to audiences in big conferences. They are speaking to board. They are speaking to boards. They are speaking to chief innovation investors, officers. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah uh, to investors, etc. Well, less than a third have not together, but at least or experience in science or in technology or as an entrepreneur. Meaning that two thirds has zero of his skills or experience. Now, here is where it's beautiful, and these guys are geniuses. Um, they speak to boards, they speak to people. So they come and they say, the future is blockchain, the future is the, meta the metaverse, the uh, future is whatever. Boards and C-level people, like many other people, you got hardworking people, but you also have lazy people. It's rare, but they are. And here is the futurist that comes and tells you, hey, the future is. And you're like, take notes. And you're like, you go back to your teams and say, guys, the future is technology X. So let's work on X. So they, they work on X. And whether it works or not, the futurist, six months later, hears back that the company now is working on X. And he's like, hey, told you so. I told you that it was happening. Then goes to another company, said, hey, in that company, I, know, I can't give a name, but they're working on what I said six months before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 then, and, and then you become this star futurist. So guys, uh, please, next time you introduce me in your next event, do not forget to put futurist <laughs> under my name because this is big news to everyone. I'm changing. I'm no longer a neuroscientist slash entrepreneur slash DJ. Screw, screw that, scratch it. I am officially a futurist now because it works better <laughs> and people will listen more. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, was, that was amazing. I mean, we can, we can keep this going for the next two hours, yeah. I'm sure. But like in, in, in what you've been talking, I think there's, we made already the introduction for our next speakers. So she's, she's going to be talking about near twins. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, and they're doing uh, amazing work. I mean, uh, I know the company, and yeah, uh, yeah. it's, it's it's a great company. Uh, I'm going to stay and listen. The last thing I awesome. want to say back to new new right and new right things, guys. I'm easy to find. Paul is easy to find. I'm very happy to have a conversation with you on this topic. We don't have to speak just about the technology, the algorithms, etc. Reach out, I got plenty of documents that That's I'm happy to actually, share. We placed a channel, like a track in the hackathon, which is gonna be about uh, design and strategy. And that's for ethics, strategies, everything. Okay, thanks, <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> and, and congratulations on, a, on an amazing event, guys. Uh, thank you again thanks for having lot. us. Thanks be inclusive. So, is gonna come next. And uh, yeah. if you want to stay and see the presentation. Yeah. Okay, should I go? Um, do you see us properly? See the presentation? Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Pires. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, Levi, as well, for this amazing talk. Uh, I'm Jose Sanchez. I'm the research director of the brain modeling team at Neuroelectrics. And today I'm going to be, uh, I have the challenge of explaining you what a neurotwin is uh, for us, for Neuroelectrics, what we do at the company with that, uh, basically, and what is the potential of them also in the future. So. Having said that, you all know already what the brain is, okay? But uh, neuroelectrics were obsessed with these electrical signals that these billion of neurons generates. 
uh, these brain waves uh, that are generated by these uh, sciences through the brain. So we are really want to understand what they mean in a healthy brain, in a pathological brain, and moreover, how we can modulate them as well. So how do we do that? So we have these devices that you see on the screen. There are these caps with electrodes that they are easy to use, non-invasive, and uh, they are for monitoring brain activity through electroencephalography or EEG. But also the same devices can be used to modulate this brain activity that I was telling you about. And how do we modulate the electrical activity of the brain with electricity as well? So these devices are not able to record the electrical activity of the brain, but to inject electricity in order to modulate these brain waves that I was telling you about. And I'm going to show you shortly how do we do that, okay? But the main motivation of for us are patients. So in our company, we're super focused or our main goal and mission is just to improve patients' lives and the quality of life of most of the patients, mostly in the field of brain disorders, such as the ones that you see here on screen. And today I'm mainly going to be focused on epilepsy. So there was a speaker before that she did a great introduction already about epilepsy, but let me uh, just explain it uh, a bit for the one sitting here. So epilepsy is a chronic disorder that uh, it's about a, a big discharge in one of these areas of the brain, electric discharge, so this electricity that I was telling you about. So in epilepsy, you have a huge discharge that is spread, spreads through the brain, causing these seizures. And then I'm sure you have seen an epileptic episode before, but then people start convulsing and, or losing consciousness even. So what do they do? So they go to the doctor, they usually uh, take drugs in order to, to reduce this uh, huge amount of electric activity, basically. But the problem is that one third of this epileptic population worldwide do not react to these anti-epileptic drugs. So even though they take the drug, they do not reduce the amount of seizures they have. And there are many solutions for them. One of them is surgery, okay, where they remove these areas that cause these electrical discharges. But as you may uh, know already, the brain is a very important organ, so you cannot remove uh, very essential parts of it. So most of these patients cannot go through surgery because they are in the, uh, the, the focus starts where the eloquent areas are, basically. But even the ones that can go, so are candidates for surgery, uh, just 60% of this surgery works. The 40% of them fail, so that leads to almost a 30% of the worldwide epileptic patients that do not currently have uh, any uh, working treatment. Uh, there are many solutions, such as viral nerve stimulation, but today I'm going to explain uh, how do we do it with the TES or this transcranial electrical stimulation that I was referring to before. So before going there, let me explain you what the transcranial electrical stimulation is and how it works. So I don't want you to imagine like a Frankenstein thingy where you just inject a high current through the scalp, okay? It's it's super low, so it's low electrical current injective, injected non-invasively through these electrodes that you see on a screen, okay? And they allow you to modulate this brain activity uh, very smoothly, let's say, and uh, it can have acute and long-lasting effect depending on the intensity of the currents that you inject through the electrodes, also depending on which electrodes you choose and the duration of this stimulation, okay? And the good part of this TES is that it can be focal or network targeting. So when you take a drug, usually it affects the full brain entirely, but with this uh, transcranial electrical stimulation, you can just target different areas specifically of the brain that you are on interest for the different pathologies that you have. So which is the mechanism behind? So, okay, so you have this cup, I can inject electrical activity through the electrodes, but uh, how does it really modulate the brain activity, right? There are many ways to do so. It depends on the waves or the type of currents that you inject through the scalp. So what you see here now on screen, it's direct current stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation or TDCS, where you apply a direct current through the scalp. Can, they can be positive or negative. So depending on the polarity of the current that you inject, you can excite the neural activities that receive this, the neural 
sorry, population that receive these activities, or you can inhibit that. For example, in the case of depression, we usually have the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that has lower electrical activity or it's depressed electrically. So what you want is excited. Okay, so what so what you do is just put electrodes in on the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and apply direct current stimulation that excites these neural populations so they can be more similar to a healthy brain, let's say. So you try to recover this excitation. In the case of epilepsy, for example, is the other way around. So you have one area of the brain that is overexcited, and what you do is you try to inhibit it. So what you do, you, you would invert the polarity of these DC uh, currents that you're applying through the scalp in order to a, uh, just these areas of the brain, like, okay, just relax. Uh, I want you to inhibit your, your overexcitement, let's say. Okay, so this is one type of the stimulation that we can apply. We can apply others. This is another type, which is the alternate current stimulation, just kind of alternate current stimulation, or TACS, where you select one frequency of interest. Uh, uh, I'm sure you all know about brainwaves, alpha, gamma, theta. So you, what you do when you stimulate uh, these electrodes in an alternate current stimulation is you make you train the neurons to oscillate at the same frequency that you are stimulating. So it's like you can modulate these waves uh, that the, the brain intrinsically generates as well. And this can be used, useful for different pathologies. For example, I'm not going to explain it today, but this has a huge potential now. We're exploring uh, it for Alzheimer's disease as well. Okay. So these will be the mechanisms that behind this uh, TES. There are many other types of waves that you can uh, apply through these electrodes, but just for you to know that they just modulate the brain activity through electricity and through these gaps as well. Okay, so having said that, which is the main challenge that we are facing uh, when we want to apply this type of simulation, right? The main challenge is that each patient is different. Each person is different, so each brain is different. Even if you are healthy, which I assume that all of you <laughs> Uh, are actually uh, so even though your healthy all your brains are different so the patterns are different of your brain and in the pathologies as well it's very important to take into account these patient specific differences so our uh, big question is okay how can we optimize the stimulation for each case so for each patient for each subject like how, how can we uh, do this so the answer is neurodynamics and uh, this is what i'm here to explain uh, you today after this introduction uh, of what we do at Neuroelectrics. So this is our line of research, Neurogenes now, and let me do an overview. So we have a patient here on the left of the screen, and for different pathologies, we have different biomarkers of the pathology and different data types that we can acquire for each patient. So what we do is to inject to, to, to eat this uh, data into a brain model or what we call a neural brain. So it's just a brain model that's able to replicate these pathology biomarkers per each uh, patient individually, okay? So what we do is to try to predict better the pathology through a model of the brain of the patient. Once we have the best fit of pathology of the patients and our neuro twin, then what we do is to stimulate the model. So it's great because I have my brain, my digital twin inside a computer, and I can start just stimulating here and then there and then there to see which stimulation will work best for each patient. Once we have this winner, let's say, so okay, we can in the model just cure this epileptic seizure or stop it. So once we have this, we go back to our patient and we apply the stimulation protocol that, that, that best fits for each patient and each pathology, okay? So this is the main concept of what a neurotwin is, what you see here on the screen. And today, as I mentioned, I'm going to do uh, this case uh, scenario where we have an epileptic patient. Here you have it on the screen. Uh, so this is Paul. It's actually not Paul, so all the data is more anonymized for sure. Uh, uh, he's 23 years old and he has drug resistant focal epilepsy. Drug resistant means that he cannot uh, uh, take antipathetic drugs, they do not work for him. And also, he has focal epilepsy. That means that there's an area of the brain that starts uh, 
creating these huge electrical discharges and sp spreading all around the brain. Okay, so these are our patients. What does the clinician usually do in this patient? So the clinician takes data of the patient, such as the magnetic resonance. Uh, so what, what does this imaging do? It just allows you to know the structure of the brain. And what we do is to take this data that the clinician has gathered, and we create our first, let's say, neural twin version of zero, right? So it's a copy of the patient's brain that just has the anatomical information. So we segment the image with the different tissues that it has, with the different conductivities that these tissues have. Uh, so we have this neural twin of, of the patient, which just has anatomical information so far. What do we do next? What does the clinician do next? We don't do anything to the patient. So the clinician just puts electrodes inside. So it's very invasive, but it's what it's done in, with epilepsy. So this is a stereotypic EEG. So what you do is you just put electrodes inside the patient's brain in the areas that the clinicians think that are of interest to detect where the focus is, to detect where this uh, huge discharge starts. Okay, so we can also know which are these areas of interest through these CT images, which is what you see on screen as well. And then we can also use the information of the electrodes. So the electrodes record this electrical activity of the brain and allow us to know which of these areas are more pathologic. Let's say, so here on the red color, you would see the focus. So it's where the seizure starts, let's say, and then it spreads to the orange uh, nodes, let's say, but there are other nodes that are healthy, which are the green ones. And uh, this SEG or stereotactic uh, EG data allow us to know which are these areas, okay? What else? We can have more information in our neural twins. So we also need to know how this epilepsy can propagate through the brain, okay? Because the, this is stereotactic electrodes, you cannot pull through all the brain. You need to infer how the different areas that do not have this information will react, okay? So this information or this map of the brain uh, can be um, acquired through the diffusion MRI. Okay, so just for you to understand better, I know most of you are not from Barcelona, but this is just a map of uh, Barcelona's metro station. Okay, so it's like a map of the brain. So if I have a seizure in Plaza Catalonia, which is the main hub of the city, if I have a seizure start, starting there, then it will spread to most of the districts that we have. Okay, but if we have the seizure starting in the airport, let's say Barcelona, which is not super well connected to the city, it will just spread through different uh, to fewer or less less uh, areas of the brain. So it's very important to have these maps of the patient as well individually because they're going to be different in each case. Okay. So what we do is to take all this network information, all this epileptogenicity information and put it in our neurotwin as well. So we have the anatomy, but now we also have the brain activity. How do we model brain activity? We use neural mass models, but it can be with any type of model that replicates electrical activity of the brain. What are these models? So these models represent populations of neurons, and the healthy ones are going to have a balance, excitation, and inhibition. Uh, okay, so we can put one of these in uh, different healthy areas of the brain, but then as we are getting closer to the brain focus, what we wish to add pathology, so add more excitation to these models, so it can replicate a seizure. Like this, for example, will be the focus. And in this node specifically, we add the most uh, pathological case, let's say. And what we, we earn from it, so it's, now we are able to replicate the patient's seizure with our neural twin, which is the simulation of the brain. And with that, we use algorithms that allow us to really match the parameters of the model with the patient, okay? So this is how it would look like. This is what the neural twin would look like in the case of epilepsy. So we are just focused on replicating the pathological biomarkers of the patient, in this case, where the focus is, how it spreads this electrical activity, okay? Once we have this neural twin, what we do is to stimulate it. And as I mentioned to before, we want to stimulate with a current that inhibits this focus. So our objective is to inhibit the epileptic focus and its propagation. So we apply this DC, uh, and in, in the and we are targeting this 
this uh, focus or seizure does not spread in the model. So what we do is to try different electrode montages, as you see on the screen. So we go to the lesser and lesser epileptogenicity levels until we have a neurotwin that is completely healthy. So we have a winner of the montages that allow us to not generate any more uh, seizures in this neurotwin. So once we have this winner montage solution, what we do is go back to our patient and apply this protocol, okay? So this would be what a neurotwin, a full neurotwin, that is not anatomical, but also functional or a little more uh, information of the patient, let's say, functional information of the patient as well. We can stimulate it and do uh, whatever montage we want, so we can find this best one and go to the patient. This is what the neurotwin looks like for, for epilepsy. So, what is next then? This is just research now, okay? But uh, what are our next steps where we at at the company with these neurotwins? So right now we are doing a huge clinical trial all around Europe and uh, the States with the most basic neurotwins, the ones that I was showing before that just have the anatomical information of the brain. Uh, so we have almost uh, 200 patients in two different uh, in, sorry, in 20 different uh, in clinics all around the, the Europe, uh, and we are working on this. And we got this uh, money to do so uh, with this pilot that I'm showing here on the screen. Uh, so this is data from uh, years ago, actually, which we did a trial in the States with Alexander Rotterdam. And we got a median of 47% seizure reduction with these neurotwins that just take into account the anatomical uh, information of the patient. So now we want to get better. We're like, okay, maybe with anatomy is not enough. Maybe we want to know how this seizure really propagates. We can really target the most important areas for each patient. Okay. So after this, we're also doing um, a long an European project that we got from an ERC grant for our collaborators in, in France, such as the University of Rennes or the Hospital of Marseille, basically. And we are creating these fully personalized neurotwins in the case on, of epilepsy. We're still on the research, uh, which is what I showed you today here. And we will start the clinical trial right next year using these fully uh, personalized neurotwins. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not just for epilepsy, but it's also for doing neurotwins for Alzheimer's disease, which is a completely different story, but very similar because we're also using functional data to, to personalize it. And it's a bigger project. It's called Neurotwin as well. And uh, we're collaborating with many collaborators here at Barcelona with UPF as well. And uh, we are starting a clinical trial with these neurotwins in less than six months. So we're very excited also to to be or to try to 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 put our brain of salt in the Alzheimer's uh, world, let's say, with this technology and with these neurotwins. And having said that, obviously, I'm not doing this alone at all. We are a super in interdisciplinary team at Neuroelectrics. It's huge, and uh, we have biomedical engineers, physicists, mathematicians, astronomers, or space engineers, psychologists. So it's a it's full team full of very talented people uh, and beautiful people as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, just thanks to them for, for making this this happen. And thanks to you and for, for all your attention. I hope you liked the talk. If you have any question and you're super shy, just you have my email there in case you want to send me an email. An email. But uh, I'm that new person, so I hope you really have questions that I can answer here. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop sharing. Uh, yeah, you can unmute uh, Jorge if you want. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we have Thank any you. further questions here. Oh, well, what is your opinion on what happens to space and time in virtual reality with respect to our cognition? Please. And Sharma says in his TEDx CCMA says 
and their brain is stitching together these brief segments of time to create abstract ideas such as space and time. Oh, I don't see. I don't think space is abstract, but okay. Um, and then, and when those brief segments are all in register with each other, things work beautifully in the deep world, and you get wonderful maps. And in virtual reality, they get busty. Here, the maps. What? Here, the maps. He speaks about brain maps that were recorded. Um, you understand? Yeah, I don't know if this question is for me or if it's for Ali. <laughs> I think it's for you. It's, it's for myself. Oh yeah. my god. Okay, that's a tricky one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let me read it again. Okay, it's a very complex question. No, it's for you. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> just that I didn't talk about the space and time so far. But it's a very uh, interesting question. Okay. What happens to space and time? With virtual reality with respect to our connection. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> I want to defend myself saying that I am not experienced in uh, virtual reality, uh, which is a super interesting to topic, but it's not my specialty as well. So with this, I don't know if I can go further <laughs> uh, because I never try to model it. I'm just expert in modeling uh, pathologies. But uh, thank you so much for the question. Yeah. Do you want to have a take on it, Olivier? You're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even read the question. I was just en en enjoying the, the amazing presentation and work of a company, Rosen. Congratulations. What you guys are doing is amazing, really. Um, and well, you don't know me, but I would have zero problem saying I don't like it if it wasn't the case. So. Get my word on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> want to know you better, so it's good. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, but, like, oh my god! Oh yeah, well, oh yeah, well. But that's uh, that's super. Uh, this is this is one crazy thing, uh, actually. Uh, the, the the space and time aspect in virtual reality, because it's there is uh, you can get it on the on the end of a, the receipt of the user, but 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 also in terms of uh, when you create environments. We are discussing with people at the moment who are um, with one crazy idea, not so crazy idea. We, uh, with respect to perception of space and in order to save some, uh, some processing power for a high definition environment like live events, et cetera, in virtual reality, uh, rather than programming movement to use optical illusions. And uh, so, so to to have a literally fixed image that in virtual reality that can create the illusion of movement, and you save a lot of processing power. And the idea, and this is where it's always good. That this is my, me trying to play the wise guy with gray hair. Um, it's always good to read the old books like um, uh, James Gibson's Ecological Psychology, uh, getting back to to. Uh, the middle of a previous century with affordances and the system environment, you know, um, the idea the idea came to us reading rereading that book, and uh, we discussed that with Paul uh, and then with some folks at um, a company called VR Room, that is producing live events, and being able to better understand uh, the, the the representation and the misrepresentation of time and space in VR uh, will be a we do a lot of good I think on saving processing power that's for the technical uh, part but also in um, giving the illusion to people that it's a real it's as real as it can be because we're making a fake or, or we misinterpret or misestimate time and space a lot in our everyday activities. And I think the, to close on that, um, trying to make virtual reality where everything is perfect is a huge mistake because um, our, I mean, the street, the street outside my place is perfect, but my perception of it is imperfect. Completely, I mean, and, and we, we're actually, you know, the, like getting back to Gibson, there. I don't know if you know Hans Hollein, the architect. He was saying uh, we don't need a lot more architecture. All we need is better drugs. Meaning that what we need is new ways of looking at the environment, new ways of, of experiencing it, rather than just like new environment itself. 
Mm-hmm. I think this is, this is super cool. And this is something we're discussing here, the idea of avatars now in, in the metaverse and in the virtual world. And then what if the avatar, I mean, avatars, if they don't have your near twin, they're not you yet, for me. That's mm-hmm. it, right? So the idea yeah. of implementing these near twins in avatars in the virtual world, I think is a crazy thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, some work I did with Kelso uh, 20 years ago that, that, that there's, for those who know, Guillaume Dumas has been working on the virtual uh, partner interaction and these algorithms in, in coordination dynamics are, are amazing. And, and this quest for realism is, is interesting. If you go back in the history of video games, think about the, the Y, the, the, the console, the Y by, uh, by Nintendo. Uh, the, the, the characters look like Playmobiles, and they literally destroyed, uh, at that time, Sega, who was going for hyper-realism. And the reason why is because those very simplistic characters were capturing what made the essence of being human and human interaction. And uh, I always use this case as a good reminder that uh, before you go for, again, the hair, you, you guys are going to think that I got a problem with uh, hair is nicely represented in the metaverse. But uh, before you go you go for that, go with what makes us human. Yes, mice. The fact I, I worked uh, with, with Fred Basso on being able to hear smiles. Listening to a smile is something that is super important for a digital twin and for interactions. All these features that makes us human are way more important than, than what is technical um, yeah, to engage. Egan right? was working on this, right? Yeah, David. David. David's been doing some uh, amazing work on this, yeah, yeah, and, and it's interesting. Illusions. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Sensory illusions. Um, think they are work. Also, it's always good to, to 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 look at some work in neurophysiology as well. I've worked with a guy who basically created casts that had vibrators that were giving you. They were doing tendon vibrations. So while you break your your forearm, it's uh, there. You know, it's not moving. But if you close your eyes with a vibration, you got the illusion. It's work. It's it's moving, and people would recover a lot faster. So this technology also can be used. And of course, there is what uh, Isaac Castro is doing with Emerge these days. If you guys have not uh, come across, go and see these guys, Isaac and, and his friends. I mean, another brilliant Spanish person. Uh, Emerge is just, yeah. Uh, we work on BCI, and this is closest to magic for me. You know, we hear a lot that you're doing BCI, you're doing magic, and we're like, nah, this is just science. But go and, and check Emerge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people don't know that most of the time the hardest part of a BCI is connecting the Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, don't get me started on that. Hey, I worked at Emoting. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. And, so, and, and to I be think... oh, oh, so, sorry, sorry, to be totally honest, yeah, I'm okay. still a share, I'm in full disclosure, I'm still a shareholder. So, okay. yeah, yeah, to add to my biases, no, just, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Emotive was the first uh, hardware I played with. Uh, eight years ago, hey, I, was, I, I was starting to play with it. I collected data before, before joining full time, so I've been on the board for almost 10 years. Yeah, well, 2012, yeah. I've collected data with emotive uh, equipment for 10 years no, no, in yeah, 22 countries, 22 countries. PC but but while I was while oh, I was wow. at Emotive, but as a neuroscientist, and I, I, and I said that publicly, while I was still at Emotive, Open BCI, GTEC, Neuroelectrics, I mean, the, I, I'm a fan because I'm a scientist above all, and I can appreciate the work of others with each com- it's It's very interesting also for people to see that each company are very good at something and not so good at some other things. Actually, and, I, and there's a question I wanted to ask you. Maybe that's the right time. Um, if we look at the ecosystem of neurotech companies, it's insanely crazy how fast the curve went, right? So yeah. we had like huge companies working on very specific products, and then suddenly you have a million companies popping up in three, four years, right? And then now the landscape is so rich with a lot of companies. If you're not very much in, you don't know who's who's doing what. You just see near tech companies left and right. So I wanted to hear a comment on, on this as a business ecosystem, as an entrepreneurial ecosystem, and, as, and at the same time, looking at it as like one ecosystem, right? Because what we're developing is near tech in the end, whether it's like 10 companies, yeah. a million, 100, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you got a, you got an answer in the business strategy that we have with Vaughn. 
um, we are hard, we are building hardware agnostic algorithms and uh, and a digital twin. So we're not doing. We decided supposedly I could have with experience I had with Emotive and some investors have offered me to create another hardware company. And the, the equipment out there is so great. I mean, I I, I mean. Um, I'm not in the room, but if I would take you to uh, to the other room of the house, you'd see that I have a collection, <laughs> and I don't have a collection, and I and I yeah yeah, and I don't and and I think like most of you, I don't have a collection to analyze the market just because I'm fascinated and I love this field. Uh, um, I think I think the, the the great it's it's fantastic to see uh, all these companies. I mean, we help each other. It's it's impossible. There was a Paul, I think, was talking to some folks yesterday. He spoke uh, in Paris uh, to the people who are doing the the hackathon in Paris, and some people said, "Oh, we are we competitors?" I'm like, you know what? The market is so huge. First, the fact that if we can help elevate the the market, we need a better regulation. The you know the stronger the regulation. Uh, the, the the better it is for the market, for the clients, because at the end, it will wash out the, the people who are just pretending and not doing some rigorous stuff. When you look at it at the end of the day, of course, it's hard for a company that came out, um, you know, uh, that, that came in the radar six months ago to claim to have as many uh, published papers as Neuroelectrics, as OpenBCI or Emotive. But um, now you can publish faster than before. You can look at what people are doing. Uh, and there is so much content, thanks to NeurotechX. Uh, Paul is a good example. My co-founder started to get content uh, on Neurotech, thanks to NeurotechX, to learn how to, how, to, how to look at the signal and see whether the signal is good or not. I mean, you don't need to be an expert now because you can get some some insights and it will clean the market. More people, more good people, but of course, if a market grows, we're going to have some charlatans. Kind of this was kind of my thoughts. Of, I mean, you, you know what happened when, when, when Elon Musk was showing, was showing his experiment? Everybody was like, uh, you know, kind of, what the fuck is this guy doing, right? Uh, and my take in this was, like, this guy has just made the wave that we can all benefit from, exactly. right? Uh, and he raised the way for everyone, even though what he was doing might not be super relevant for the internal. Listen, something he's leading. Come on, so, yeah. Whomever, whomever is involved in the business and sees Musk coming should be thankful. Whatever Musk yeah, does. That's, that's that's first exactly because right. first because thanks to Musk, my grandma finally understands or thinks she understands what I do. And I've been in the business for 20 years and she had no freaking clue. Now Elon Musk is in it and she says, oh, Neurotech. I'm like, okay, good. Um, <laughs> se 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 yeah. Second, because whether you, 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 you like what he does or not and the way his narrative, he's managed to gather the, to gather the work of, of great scientists of course, and to put yeah. it in a, in a form of narrative package, at least, that people understand and see the benefits. Then we could talk about capital. We can talk about a, a lot of things. But at the end of the day, what is interesting is to say that him or, or, or Brian Johnson, seeing these people yeah, putting this Brian amount Johnson, of money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but at the end of the day also, you see them and Facebook, back then it was still Facebook, that are revising their timelines. And suddenly, a lot of people who are coming in and think they are going to tackle this business the way they tackled the... Uh, the car industry, space, etc. Ooh, huh, uh, it's not that simple. Um, it's not that simple. So it's also, I think, the fact that uh, um, uh, Musk and Brian they they revise their timelines and their roadmaps is also paying a lot of respect to the work a lot of people have been doing. Saying, course, yeah, this yeah. thing up there, this thing up there is not as as simple as you think. But I mean, thank you for entering this field. I mean, oh, seriously, Colonel, Colonel is amazing. Colonel is like the, for me, they're making the Rolls Royce of. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether that reference speaks to the younger yeah, audience, but so, so uh, the Ferrari. Listen to us, please give us a Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> no, amazing, amazing. But but look. Compare, compare what they're producing to what Neuroelectrics is, uh, is producing, you cannot collect the data in the same environment 
because the bulkiness is different. Because except, so the fact that we've got this palette of of hardware that we can choose uh, and and select depending on what we're interested in isn't that amazing when you compare to less than ten years ago where you were stuck with three four companies that were more expensive and everything. Now we got the choice. I would I would love to be uh, the age of my co-founder now and entering the field because. It's just, it's just amazing. I mean, fully on point. I, mean, I, I totally agree. And I, I, I've been kind of involved for the last eight years only. And I come from a background of design, not near tech. And then suddenly just got lost in this. Big well, world. so in design, yeah. in design, you must have heard of Norman. And Norman was inspired by Gibson. And we're, uh, we're closing no, no, the loop. Gibson very well. <laughs> no, all these guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, so, no, no, this is so cool. About, uh, all right. Hey, thanks again, Rosen. Give everyone uh, uh, a, a big, a big hi from uh, from here, and uh, I'll be visiting you soon, uh, guys. Uh, I'm close. Um, most of the time, I'm in Marseille. And, uh, I think we're, we're gonna we're gonna okay. at, some, at some point soon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And just for, to to Rosen Adele. <laughs> okay. Ciao, everyone. That was a great day. Great way to close it. See you tomorrow.